You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. Just now we have Lee Marshall from Wrestle Reunion on the phone. Lee, it's great to speak with you. How are you doing today, buddy? Oh, I had a bad day. I'm doing really well. Really well. Good to speak with you guys. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Well, let's get right into the questions. Sure. How did you get hooked up with the Wrestle Reunion? Oh, well, uh, through uh, some people that I've known throughout the years, uh, Sal Corrente, who uh, primarily is the, the creator and the promoter of, uh, of Wrestle Reunion, and, and Rob Russin, who I worked with back in the old AWA days, and uh, they uh, contacted me and asked to if I'd be a participant, and I said, well, absolutely, I'd be honored to. I wasn't able to make the first one, but I you know, was able to juggle schedules around, so I'd be able to do the one in Pennsylvania coming up. Mm, excellent. Uh, excellent. Big fans of Rob Rustin here on the interactive interview. Yeah. Rob, Rob's, Rob's one of the best, one of the best. He's a good friend to have, as I always tell everybody. You know it. Absolutely. Um, you just mentioned the AWA. What was it like working under the incomparable Vern Gagne? Uh, you know, pretty interesting, because... Uh, uh, you know, I've been, I've been doing this a long time. Ironically, I know you guys are based in Phoenix, and I, I started my radio career in Phoenix, mm-hmm. and that's where I first uh, uh, did professional wrestling as well, uh, in 1968, I think. Uh, wow. Something like that. Uh, at the old uh, Phoenix Madison Square Garden. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that even exists anymore. Probably not. Probably not. But, you know, starting there and... Uh, you know, work in the territories like, uh, you know, like the wrestlers did, and uh, was actually working for the WWF when they first started, uh, you know, making a national push, and I got uh, a call from Vern Gagne, who, uh, actually I got a call from Red Bastien, who uh, I'm sure many of the uh, wrestling historians might recall Red, yep. and he said, you know, Vern really wants to talk to you about, uh, about doing play-by-play on the wrestling shows that are going to go on ESPN which seemed pretty exciting because it was, at the time, the first network broadcast of professional wrestling. So I said, yeah, why not? So uh, I actually left the WWF and, uh, and went to the AWA and did, uh, did commentary for, as you said, the incomparable Vern Gagne and that organization for, uh, for some time, and it was great, great fun. Mm-hmm. What radio station do you work with out here in Phoenix? I, I don't even know that it, it exists anymore. It was uh, called KLIZ, Chris. And it was located at 12:30 on the AM dial, the dirty 12:30. And uh, back in the day, you know, we, we were the we were the top rock and roll station, and our main competition was KRUX, <laughs> which uh, was 13:60, I think. <laughs> I don't even know what they're doing now. And uh, it was it was uh, quite interesting. You know, I'd, I'd uh, started as I said, started my career in, in in Phoenix in 1964. I was a sophomore in high school. I just moved from. Uh, you know, being, I was born and raised in Hollywood and uh, moved to Phoenix when I was uh, a teenager and went to Central High School in Phoenix, Arizona okay. and uh, started my career when I was a sophomore. They hired me to do the 7 to Midnight show on, uh, on a radio station there. Excellent. Excellent. Bobby Heenan had a couple uh, adjectives or names for the AWA. One of them was All the World's Assholes and another, <laughs> and another one was the Alzheimer's Wrestling Association. Um, <laughs> Why do you think the AWA did not ultimately um, make it? I mean, I know it did for many years, but why did it close up shop? Uh, probably a multitude of reasons. Uh, you know, you have to remember that the AWA, you know, for quite a while was the top organization. It, it had, uh, you know, more shows, more, more cities, more markets, you know, more everything than, than any other organization. Absolutely. And uh, very simply refused to change with the times. You know, Vince McMahon, love him or hate him, uh, you know, sort of the Charlie O. Finley of professional wrestling in a lot of ways, uh, came up with some ideas. You know, e- even something as, as, as simple as, uh, as music when the wrestlers were making their way to the ring. You know, nobody ever did that before. And uh, there were some, you know, hardliners in the AWA that, that always maintained that, that the wrestling would uh, be much more appealing than the gimmickry. Hmm. Well, I'm not saying that everybody else was just gimmickry, but they managed to combine, uh, you know, superior wrestling and superior gimmickry, and, and uh, the AWA fell by the wayside. Hmm. 
Another announcer that was working with you in the AWA was Eric Bischoff, who ended up being in charge of WCW in a turn of events that nobody understands. How did Eric end up being in charge of the WCW? Uh, you know, Eric, you know, I'd like to say I taught him everything he knows. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, Eric, Eric really was kind of, I was his mentor as an announcer. And uh, Eric was uh, given the opportunity to go to the WCW uh, as an announcer, and he, uh, you know, went to Atlanta. And, uh, you know, Eric, Eric was one of those guys, and this is probably a good lesson in any kind of business, I suppose. Eric wanted to know everything there was about the business, not just the wrestling part of it and the booking part of it and, you know, the, the matchmaking part of it, but he wanted to understand the television end of it, the production side of it, the business side of it. And he really became a student of the entire business. And uh, with that, he... Uh, you know, managed to uh, to uh, get the attention of some people within the WCW at the time. Uh, you know, most obviously Ted Turner, and uh, he uh, uh, became the man in charge of WCW. Wow! How did you end up uh, signing with WCW? Uh, Eric had, uh, for some time, had wanted me to you know come back and work, and I said, no, you know, I'm I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to move to Atlanta. I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, you know, I live in LA. I, I, I do a lot of things out here. And uh, it just wasn't anything I wanted to do. And he, he finally said, look, how about if you don't move from L.A. and you just, you know, fly to all the events and, and, uh, and like that? Well, we, we came to an agreement, and, uh, and uh, I did that for, uh, for five years until finally uh, you know, I had some, some production uh, things I was doing in L.A. And, and I got to tell you, the travel just wore me out. Uh, it actually at one time became a health issue for me. Uh, wow. But uh, I couldn't be on the road that much because I have some some other obligations. One is that, you know, for the past six years, I've been fortunate enough to be the voice of Tony the Tiger, and, and that's pretty demanding as far as schedule. That's and, great. Uh, uh, I just couldn't be on the road constantly. So uh, I left WCW and... and uh, uh, Shortly thereafter, I guess they, uh, you know, they merged or did whatever they did with uh, with uh, WWE, and uh, I had a wonderful time with WCW. It gave me a chance to work with some guys that I'd worked with, uh, you know, over over the years. Well, speaking of the traveling, what was it like traveling with Bobby the Brain Heenan behind the scenes? Can you share us uh, a few <laughs> stories? <if you> know? <laughs> it depends on uh, on on the rating of the show, guys. Uh, no, Bobby was uh, Bobby was always great yeah. fun to be around. Uh, you know, we we supposedly had uh, uh, a feud. You know, there was the Bobby Heenan Lee Marshall feud, and and that was uh, uh, really nothing more than than an angle that uh, that somebody came up with. We were very very close friends, have been for many 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 years, and it was always uh, fun to travel with Bobby uh, because he, he's a pretty quirky guy, and I guess I am too. And you know. You know, you guys probably are too. Uh, Bobby always uh, had, a, had a thing for wanting to get back to the hotel right away, and he always hated it when I drove because I have absolutely no sense of direction, zero. I'm I'm just the worst. And I'd also at uh, one time underwent uh, the laser eye surgery, so uh, there was a time where my, especially at night, uh, my vision was a little not blurry, but you know, you get those little halos and whatever. So uh, he was actually uh, not happy to drive with me, and my position was, hey, it really doesn't matter where we're going, Brain. You know, everything's an adventure. We don't have to be back to the hotel right away. And uh, it, it was always fun traveling with Bobby, especially in some of the more remote areas. I do remember we, uh, we were in the south somewhere. We had, we had a rule at uh, WCW that uh, <laughs> if it was 200 mile, miles or less from one city to the next, we had to drive. Otherwise, we could fly. And uh, this happened to be a, a shot that was, you know, probably 150 miles away. So we got in the car. It was me, Tony Schiavone, uh, the brain, and, uh, you know, maybe Mike Sinead or Okerlund. You know, it could have been, I, I forget who was, the other ones were. But uh, we just encountered the, this little southern restaurant, and their, their uh, blue plate special was hot dog salad. And, wow. Uh, we, oh, yeah. You know. that, that's a... Definite mixture. A, a, a wonderful southern delicacy, I'm sure. But, yeah, yeah. you know, you just encountered all kinds of interesting things when you're on the road. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Heenan was, uh, was a lot of fun. We, uh, 
we uh, spent so many hours together, you know, both uh, behind the microphones and behind the scenes and in the dressing rooms. And, you know, that's, that's, that's where we always said the best fun and the best fights were was, was, was in the back. Absolutely. Well, speaking of fights, what was the backstage atmosphere like in WCW? Really, very good. Uh, you know, everybody seemed to, uh, to 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 get along and be pretty supportive of uh, of everybody else. Uh, you know, we didn't really have, uh, uh, and I really would tell you if I thought there was something that that, that was ugly. Uh, I mean, why not? It, you know, the dirt sheets probably had it, but you know, nothing that really comes comes to mind that was was horrible. You, you guys have to understand that wrestling is very, very, very fraternal, and in, in my case, uh, the reason I got into wrestling at all was my grandfather was a wrestler, so I was kind of born into it. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I was on the radio, <laughs> pardon me, the uh, guys that had the territory in Phoenix, they were looking for somebody who not only knew about wrestling, but was also a broadcaster. So at a very young age, I filled the bill. So back in the old Phoenix Madison Square Garden days, uh, the top heel at the time was Iron Mike DiBiase, who mm-hmm. was Ted DiBiase's son. So, you know, I've known Ted since essentially we were both kids. Mm-hmm. And you just know these guys for so many years that uh, it really becomes very, very familial, which isn't to say, you know, brothers and sisters and brothers and brothers fight all the time. Mm-hmm. And that certainly was the case. But it was probably more familial than, in, than any other sport I can think of. You weren't at the event where he passed away, were you? I am Mike DiBiase. Oh, where, where Mike uh, passed away? No, I was not. Yeah, I, mean, I, I wouldn't have... Not. I think that was in Texas, so I could be mistaken. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, when did you actually stop working with WCW? Uh, 2000. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that was uh, when I uh, I left WCW and uh, really, uh, th- there's a, you know, my wife asks me all the time, do you miss it? Do you miss it? And everybody asks me, you know, once in a while. Well, do you uh, miss it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, uh, and and what I miss, guys, is really what I was talking about was was, was the camaraderie. I miss, uh, uh, you know, being uh, being back with the fellows and uh, uh, you know just uh, telling stories. And uh, that was always the best part of wrestling to me was was being in the dressing room before an event. Uh, WCW, for example, would be uh, you know me and Larry Zabisco and and Dusty Rhodes and Shivani and and Heenan and uh, Okerlund and. Uh, we just had, had great fun, and then you know everybody got together—the the announcers and the wrestlers—and it was, uh, and, and the crew guys certainly. You know, they they're, they're the unsung heroes of any wrestling production. Is you know the guys out there that set things up and you know run the cameras and are out in the truck making sure it looks good. Uh, it was a very very, uh, like I said, familial environment, and and that's really what I miss. Do I miss uh, the travel? Oh, not not ever. You know, it's been, in 1998, I think, or 99, I was Delta Airlines' top domestic uh, passenger. I had over a million miles just on Delta Airlines in one year. Wow. Well, let me ask you a radio-based question, as, as yes. I'm in radio myself. Uh, um, what was the production uh, like as far as radio versus um, television, and, and more specifically, uh, wrestling? Uh as, as far as what you you know wrestling uh, coverage of wrestling or or or, uh, or I mean as far as is, is the announcing aspect is oh I see well you know it was th- there was no real syndicated radio I, you know although I've been on radio for you know over forty years hard as that is to believe especially for me uh, back then there was no satellite programming or syndicated programming and and uh, the guys on the radio. The, and I, and I say guys because women really didn't get into it until you know the, the, the 70s. You know you had to be you had to be funny and spontaneous and intelligent, and you had to be well read. You had to go to theater. You, had, you know you, you just really needed to know everything that was going on, especially within you know your localized community. You know whether it was New York City or 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 or, or Blythe, California. Uh, you needed to be able to relate to the audience, and I think that's. That's how uh, radio has certainly changed over the years, and, and I don't much care for it. And uh, I think that that was really a, a good a good launching pad for anybody that uh, that does professional wrestling, because you have to have an affinity for first of all what you're doing, and you have to have an affinity for 
the sport, for the guys, uh, for, if, if you will, the, the theater of it all, because it is entertainment, just like radio is. And, you know, I, I, I don't shrink from the word entertainment because I think the NBA is entertainment and Major League Baseball is entertainment and, you know, the, uh, the NFL is entertainment. I mean, you, you buy a ticket to go to an event to be entertained. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an old radio guy. Gene Okerlund is an old radio guy. Uh, Tony Schiavone. Uh, we, we all have our, our roots in radio. Mm. You know, it's funny. Through, through my education, I've actually had the opportunity to sit down and actually watch some old tapes of old, uh, of old radio jocks um, trying to learn my craft. Uh, and to see the personality that they had to actually ooze out over the mic. Oh, absolutely. What I see now is just such a vast difference. And, and I agree with you. Uh, I gotta say, it's kind of sad to see such a change happen. Yeah, radio was never intended to be a one-size-fits-all media, which is why I'm really glad to be on the air with you guys, uh, because you know exactly who you're talking to. It's not like TV, where you know you're trying to talk to everybody at the same time. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if you, know, you watch, the, the, if you the, watch something like Good Morning America, you see them yeah. interview Batista, and they they talk to him like he's a bull, like how much you lift. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, who cares? Right. right. You know, uh, with, with radio, uh, you know, if you're playing rock and roll, you know, the people that are listening like rock and roll. Or if you're playing, you know, like, like I do, I, I have, uh, uh, you know, a, a number of oldies uh, stations throughout the country that, that I program. You know, I know exactly who the audience is. Country music, the same way. News talk, the same way. I mean, you really know who you're talking to. Uh, TV, you know, the, the, same, the same TV show that's showing, uh, you know, 60 Minutes, you know, earlier in the morning was showing Woody Woodpecker cartoons. You know, it, it, it just runs too much of a gamut. You try to, you try to appeal to too many people with TV. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not doubting TV. I think, you know, the service they provide, of course, is, is obviously wonderful. But it's not as personal as radio. Mm. You know, when, when you think about how you listen to the radio, uh, you're probably alone. <laughs> as opposed to, you know, nobody sits in their living room with their family and watches the radio. <laughs> so radio becomes a, a far more personal form of communication because you're really quite likely only talking to one person and that one person tuned into you because there's something about you that they really like you know which which even makes it that much more upsetting with with the clear channels and oh, if sure. i'm getting into the business it's hard for me to to actually want to you know work for such a station in some aspects simply because they take the jocks that they get and they almost take that personal um aspect away from them by oh. telling them you know everything scripted what they have to say and it's kind of dejecting in a way. It is, and, and this will be kind of a, a left-handed analogy, guys, uh, radio and wrestling. As you said, radio is, you know, uh, everybody doing the same thing, saying the same thing, and really not, not having an affinity for anybody in particular. Uh, you know, you, you and I, we're here in the western United States. You know, somebody on the East Coast, they think differently, they do different things, they have different likes and dislikes than we do, and you can't go on the radio and try to appeal to everybody. Uh, and what I really don't like about the state of radio now is there are no places to go for a young person to learn the business of radio. You know, the, the, you can't do, uh, you know, the all-night show in Yuma, because that show doesn't exist anymore. There's some satellite program that's doing that show. Well, that's where a young disc jockey or a news person or sports commentator, you went and you, you learned and you, and you made your mistakes and you got better, and, and that's how you wound up in, in, in L.A. or Detroit or, or, or Boston or New York. Uh, and the same with wrestling. You know, the territories used to allow a young wrestler to, to learn the craft, you know, take the bumps, you know, develop a persona, right. and that doesn't exist anymore. There are there are no more territories per se. I mean, there are a few independents out there, but 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 no place where where a young wrestler could go on the road, literally five days a week, uh, you know, town to town, and uh, and learn the sport of wrestling and learn everything that there was to learn about it. And a lot of it is, uh, again, like you said, you, you you listen to the old tapes of the old disc jockeys. Uh, a lot of what a lot of the younger wrestlers were able to to, uh, to learn back in the day, and it wasn't that long ago, was if you just shut your mouth in the dressing room, 
you would learn more about professional wrestling by listening to people like a Bruno Sammartino or a Freddie Blassie or a Bobby Heenan or a Dusty Rhodes or a Ric Flair. Just be quiet and listen to what these guys have to tell you. And you'll learn more about the business, you know, in a, in a year doing that than, than anything I can think of. But that doesn't exist anymore. Mm. In the old days, Actually, we just uh, had an opportunity to sit down with Charlie Haas, who was recently released from the WWE. Uh -huh. His motto is exactly what you're just talking about. He said, you know, when I'm in the locker room, uh, I keep my, 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 my ears open and my eyes and mouth uh, shut. All he does is listen to what's going on. There's and really, really try to absorb. There's almost an, an unwritten rule in wrestling, and that is unless you've been doing it for five years, you don't get a vote. You don't get to talk. And it's, it's not like a hazing, like somebody's going to jump you if you do. But if you're smart, like Charlie, just be quiet and listen to what these men are telling you or actually telling each other, and you'll pick up more. You know. And the other thing is, after a number of years, especially in, in, in wrestling, as I say, being as fraternal as it is, you kind of earn your stripes. You, 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 you've earned the, the, the right to have an opinion about something. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it's, it's really not dissimilar from being, uh, you know, being a rookie in, uh, in, in, in baseball. You know, a, a rookie playing for the Houston Astros is not going to go into the clubhouse and tell Roger Clemens how to throw a fastball. Right. Absolutely. It, it, it's really the same dynamic. Absolutely, and if you remember, you know, 10 years ago, people would go to Memphis, or 20 years ago, I should say, and they'd be in Memphis for a good five years before they thought they were good enough to go up to the WWF or whatever, like Honky Tonk Man, for example. Sure. He was wrestling from 78 to 88 before he decided, well, I guess I'm good enough now, you know? Yeah, that's a, an interesting story, the whole Honky Tonk Man story. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, uh, um, uh, he, he was actually uh, designated to be the first Brutus Beefcake. Huh. But but he got sick, so wow. uh, Vince, uh, you know, did did what he did, and and uh, you know, and Ed Leslie became Brutus uh, Brutus Beefcake. Yeah, who we just so, interviewed. Yeah. Yeah, he's very interesting. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, he is. And a lot of the guys are very very interesting. Uh, when when yeah. you get to know them, one of the things that that I think uh, is is very interesting for fans is is the majority of these guys were college All-Americans, either as uh, football players, uh, basketball players in some cases, like, like uh, Kevin Nash, uh, or, or wrestling All-Americans. And those that played football or, or, or basketball, you know, maybe they had an injury that didn't allow them to go into the NBA or the NFL. Most of these guys and are, are college graduates, and many of them have graduate degrees. <laughs> Absolutely. If we could take a step back for just a second. Sure. We're talking about all this, all this stuff with WCW a little earlier. Uh, something that still boggles my mind is how cheap the company was sold to Vince McMahon, especially when somebody else was willing to pay more money for it. Let's talk about uh, the death of WCW and your opinions of it. Oh, gee, it was, uh, I was really, uh, really sad to see it go. Like, uh, it was sad to see any wrestling uh, organization go just because... Uh, I don't like it when, when one company, and this is nothing against Vince or WWE, uh, you know, it could have been, uh, you know, Vern and the AWA, or, you know, who knows. But for one company to so control uh, the sport, I, I, I didn't like, and, and uh, most people don't. Uh, the death of WCW, you know, uh, I, I don't fully understand it. I don't get it. Uh, you know, I know it was a very expensive organization to run, but... But it was different than, than the WWE. And we always thought that, that we had the advantage, for, and for a long time we did. Because keep in mind, the WCW was, was a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Ted Turner's dynasty. <laughs> so in actuality, the WCW was part of a television company that produced wrestling. Whereas the WWE was a wrestling company that had to produce television. Right. So all we really, you know, in actuality, although, you know, we had sellout crowds, you know, virtually everywhere, it really didn't matter what the WCW did at the gate because to Turner, we were just producing another TV show. Huh. 
and, and the bulk of the money came from advertising revenues. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when you start selling out, you know, uh, you know multi-thousand uh, seat venues, you know, then even Ted Turner's eyes get open because there's a lot of money to be made there. But, uh, you know, money-wise, the, uh, the gate was really not the driving force for WCW, where it was for WWF and, and now WWE. Absolutely. You did some work with Women of Wrestling. Yeah. Um, that company seemed to have an odd cult following throughout the years. Uh, what's your take on that company? You know, I really thought it was a good idea. Uh, David McLean, uh, he, David's kind of a P.T. Barnum kind of guy. I've known David a long time, and he asked me to be involved in it. It sounded fine. It, uh, and uh, he had some very, very good athletes involved in it. And he was uh, based at the Forum, uh, you know, the former home of the L.A. Lakers. Correct. And uh, it, just, uh, it just wasn't marketed properly. Hmm. It, uh, it, it just ran out of steam, unfortunately. But yeah, it was it was it was it was kind of cultish, kind of cool. Uh, it did have uh, have its own following, mm-hmm. you know. It, uh, like anything David McLean does, it's kind of done with a, with, with a wink and a smile. <laughs> yeah, I mean, from what I understand, a lot of the guys that were in the WCW and WWF locker rooms were actually watching it. And uh, one of the things that they loved, from uh, what a couple people told us, was the Patty Pizzazz theme song. They used to <laughs> sing it to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably so. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we actually did a, a, a pay per view where where uh, uh, Bobby Heenan and I uh, you know kind of reunited to do the the, uh, the commentary on it. So uh, that that was fun. So Bobby even had a uh, uh, a tour with uh, with uh, Women of Wrestling. And I think he had the line of the night when he said, "This is the first time I've looked up a guy's trunks." Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but knowing Heenan, it probably wasn't. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> No, Bobby's done. <laughs> There's nothing that Bobby Heenan hasn't done in this uh, in this sport, and uh, for him to be inducted into the Hall of Fame is is, is really tremendous. And uh, I know it meant a lot of uh, a lot to Bobby and a lot to his family uh, to see him inducted into the uh, into the Hall of Fame. We interviewed him uh, literally just days after he was inducted last year, and you know, he you can tell that he legitimately and emotionally was you know honored by it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, because uh, it, you know wrestling is uh, you know a, a sport and, and entertainment. It is whatever you know whatever label you want to put on it. That really has never done a very good job of of validating uh, its own. Uh, you know, it, in fact, some say wrestling is a business that, that eats its young, and there, there probably is uh, more examples of that than, than anything else. Uh, you know, there really is no standing Hall of Fame for professional wrestling. Right. You know, stuff like, like Cooperstown for baseball or even the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Yeah. You know, th- there's not a building where you can go into and, and see uh, clips of Gorgeous George or, you know, see uh, uh, Sputnik Monroe's, uh, you know, ring robe. You know, right. that, that doesn't exist. So the next best thing is, is, is uh, what... Uh, the McMahon family did, and uh, and Bobby uh, certainly worthy of of induction into that or any other wrestling Hall of Fame. Yeah, and they're doing their best with that. I I hope that they would one day open a building. However, I must say that um, if they're going to make it a true wrestling Hall of Fame, that they have to start inducting people like Hackenschmidt and people that go way back when. So they so they have a full gamut of who was there. You know, you also have to you also have to validate and and induct people outside of your own organization. Uh, I did an interview recently, which I'm actually going to send you guys uh, to see what you think, uh, an interview that I did with Bruno Sammartino. Excellent. And this gave me an opportunity to talk to Bruno about what I've always called the greatest match that never was, which would have been a match between Bruno Sammartino and Vern Gagne. Hmm. And both of them, both Vern and Bruno, regret that that match never took place uh, for you know, to some people for some very obvious reasons. But for it to be a, a, a legitimate Hall of Fame, as you said, you've got to induct, you know, Hackenschmidt, you've got to induct Vern Gagne, and you've got to induct you know, guys that were not in your organization. Mm. Absolutely, and, and that's going to be a, something that we're going to have to see years down the line when it's time for somebody like Sting to be inducted. You know, will, will they do it? Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know why they would. Be, you know, maybe he'd be the first. Uh, 
uh, although by all rights he shouldn't be. Right. Uh, you know, let's go back, like you said, to to the Hackenschmitz or even uh, uh, guys like Gorgeous George or uh, or uh, uh, some of the guys from you know Count Billy Varga, uh, uh, John Tolis, you know, guys that 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 really paid their debt in blood to the sport, but uh, never never worked for uh, for the McMahon family, right. which is not to say that. You know, that, that's not a rub on the McMahon family, you know? Yeah, absolutely not. It's just that, that, that these uh, these people never uh, never wrestled for the McMahons. How can you have a Hall of Fame without uh, without Gorgeous George? It's like, how can you have a Hall of Fame without, you know, Ty Cobb? Absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned that uh, you've been doing the voice of Tony the Tiger lately. I've got a favor to ask you. Could you give us uh, one there, great? Sure. Let me let me find it in my throat here because it always kind of, kind of comes from the back. They're great. Wow. Wow. I'm impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I never even thought of it until you said that. Then I thought for a second, wow, I sound like I'm interviewing Tony the Tiger. It seems like a perfect fit for you. <laughs> well, I'm really looking forward to uh, to the Wrestle Reunion event. You know, not only hooking up with uh, you know some of the guys again, but uh, uh, you know I'm anxious to see the Funk Brothers wrestle. The Funks and, and, and Mick Foley yeah. you know, taking on the original Midnight Express. That should be a lot of fun. That should be. And he's also doing his own uh, Mick at Night show, from what I have uh, understand from uh, yeah. Bob Russell. Yeah, he is. He is. And that should uh, be extremely entertaining. Right. In fact, I'm uh, you know, going to go uh, later on this month to uh, Puerto Rico to do a show with Rob mm. to, uh, to San Juan. And I think uh, uh, Diamond Dallas Page is, uh, is on that show as well. Yes, there's a lot of stars that he's got. He's got a lot of things going on with that Gladiator Championship Wrestling. I hope that he can find some uh, television deal or something, because that would be a uh, very interesting thing to watch. Yeah, I, I think it will be. Uh, like I said, I'd, I'd like I'd like for there to be, you know, some other organizations. Uh, you know, uh, TNA. You know, they're, they're they're trying as best they can to to do uh, you know to make a, a, an impact, and uh, I, I guess they are. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is quite good, but uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, it's a WWE, WWE world, and uh, some people think that's wonderful, and some people don't. And uh, you know, I always uh, I always like to have more options than just vanilla. Right. Right. Indeed. You mentioned just a few minutes ago about some of the interviews that you've sat down to do, and we definitely plan to air those. Great. Um, on some of our internet radio shows. Why don't you tell the fans a little bit about what they can expect from this uh, vast stockpile uh, of interviews that you possess? Well, there, there was two that that, uh, that I was really anxious to do. One was, uh, of course, with Bruno Sammartino, who... Uh, yeah, I interviewed him, luckily enough, about uh, two years ago, and what a great guy he was. You know, for for those that have been around for a while, you know who he is, and, and for those kind of new to the sport, unfortunately, uh, you don't. Uh, and, and this is a, a problem, you know, with, with the WWE and, and, and only, I don't know, you know, there's something going on between the McMahons and Bruno that, uh, for whatever reason, they, they will not validate him on the level in which he should be, or any overture that they make is rejected by Bruno. Uh, something's going on there. And, and, and it's quite unfortunate. But uh, the point is, Bruno Sammartino, you know, long before there was a, a Hulk Hogan or a, or a Ric Flair, I mean, this was the the guy. And, uh, you know, uh, at the time it was it was Bruno Sammartino and Vern Gagne were, were, were the heavyweight champions of the world, undisputed. And uh, he was spectacular. Uh, the other interview was with Larry Zabisco. And... Uh, the position I took with Larry is is one that I've held for a long time, and that is if if you really take the time to look at the record, uh -huh. there's probably no professional wrestler that has held more world belts than Larry Zabisco. The guy's been a tag team champion. He's been a world champion, uh, you know, multiple times and in multiple uh, organizations. Uh, but somehow, you know, his position has always been, I'm the guy that retired Bruno Sammartino, I'm the guy that retired Nick Bockwinkle. And I just confronted him with that. You know, why, why does your legacy always have to be you know, associated with, with that when, when your record as a professional wrestler is, is so, so above reproach? 
And he thought about it, and he gave me what I thought was the first time he honestly answered it. And that was that the problem that he really has was with promoters. They would never give him the push that they would give to uh, to uh, uh, a Bruno San Martino or a Ric Flair or a Hulk Hogan or, or somebody else who had, who had ever won a championship. And, and Larry was also uh, one of those guys who would just speak his mind. And he admits, you know, that, that, that Bruno San Martino is and always will be his hero. But he feels that in, when, when you reference professional re- wrestlers, he goes, why is it always Bruno and Larry? Why is it always Gagne and Larry? Why is it always Hogan and Larry? Why is it always Bockwinkle and Larry? It should be Larry and Bruno and Larry and Hogan and Larry and Flair. And, and again, if you really want to take the time and, and look into it, you could probably make a case for Larry's position. Yeah. And I think that's the first time he's really come out and, and said that he, he, he feels that he's been, uh, been snubbed, uh, that, uh, that his, uh, his status as, as a professional wrestler and his accomplishments as a professional wrestler have not been validated by either the promoters or the media uh, at the level that they probably rightly deserve to be uh, addressed. Right. Uh, he was probably my second or third interview going way back to 2002. Yeah, way back. But, um, you know, I did an interview with him, and I'll never forget that a year later the phone rings, and it's him, and, you know, I don't know why he called me, but he just wanted to talk wrestling for a few minutes. And I was oh, just, yeah. I was stunned. I was like, wow, I'm sitting here getting a personal phone call from one of perhaps the greatest of all time. And it's oh, a real absolutely. Honor. And, you know, a, 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 a lot of the wrestlers are, are, are like that. You know, if they, if they find somebody in the media that they know is really knowledgeable, it isn't just a mark, you know, and isn't going to ask a bunch of stupid questions, but really, you know, has, has a feeling for what it is to, to participate in this sport. They love to talk about it. They love to talk about wrestling. They're proud of what they do. Right. Well, then you got to remember the name James Walsh, because I'll tell you what, he is a, a true wrestling aficionado. Uh, him and I have had many discussions where, you know, we, we've talked about, like you said, watching wrestling at ESPN, remembering um, Jeff Jarrett just getting his start in the business. Sure. Uh, I mean, the transformation that he's made over the years. And uh, I definitely agree with you. I think wrestlers are proud of what they do and definitely enjoy that aspect, because there's so many interviews that you hear on other radio stations and, and other Internet shows where, you know, it is just people who, who, you know, know the last maybe two, three years of the business. It yeah. don't really offer the history. And, and, you know, I think whenever someone can sit down in an interview capacity and talks to wrestlers, you know, about the history of the business, it makes it that much more entertaining. Right. And, like I said, they, did, they don't like, and I don't like, you know, talking to, to what, what are known as marks. You know, uh, the dirt sheet guys, uh, you know, uh, the people that do those, you know, I have really nothing against them, but but I think anybody that is into that so much that, you know, to me they're like Trekkies. You know, they just suck the fun right out of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, why can't you just enjoy it for what it is? Right. There's, there's a happy medium between being knowledgeable about it and being obsessive and, and really uh, obnoxious about it as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I've known, uh, you know, people, you know, throughout my life, they could, they could recite every stat off the back of every baseball card ever printed but wouldn't know what hand to put a glove on. Yeah, but they but they think they know everything about about the business, about the sport. And uh I I I, I don't know what to you know, to tell people like that other than well you you know, you really don't. Right. You know, you think you do but you don't. I mean, I mean, there's just so many questions that we ask that I know a lot of other people have, have asked, like, what are your thoughts on the death of WCW? The difference is we, we actually care regarding, you know, why it happened, the ramifications that it, that it had to the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and to some level, we're concerned about the workers themselves. You know, where do they go? You know, there's no competition. And, and not just to get dirt, but because, you know, when we saw WCW close, we understood that, you know, it would be nice to see, you know, WCW and WWF interact to some degree. Right. But, you know, it was going to leave a huge void in the business that was detrimental to a lot of people. I was watching wrestling for, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years at that point, and I actually stopped watching for over a year. Not many people know this, but I actually stopped watching for over a year because I thought, well, what's going to happen? Competition is what makes the business get better. Raw got, Raw got better because Nitro was better than that. 
And, uh, you know, that's what and Nitro kept trying to be better than Raw. And that's what gave good programming on both channels on Monday right. night. Well, we, you know, we had, we had the double barrel. We had Nitro and Thunder. And, uh, you know, that was uh, personally the, the, the thing that, that, that I'm very proud of, and I know that uh, a lot of other guys are, are proud of, it was uh, our Thunder show was on Thursday nights. Uh-huh. And... Thursday nights were, was the night on which the Seinfeld show was also aired. Yeah. And the, the last Seinfeld show, there were so many local TV stations and even some of the, the cable networks that did not program anything new because they know they were going to get killed. So why, why, you know, why waste a new episode of something when Seinfeld's going to kill us? Well, we went on with our Thunder show. Uh, and we had one of the highest ratings that that show ever had uh, on the uh, the night of the, the Jerry Seinfeld show, uh, Swan Song. So, uh, yeah, it was it, it was it was a great time, and, and I'm I'm sorry that's gone. Really sorry it's gone. And, I, and I'll tell you what else I'm sorry about. You know, these people want to ask about the death of of, of WCW. Uh, you know, we also need to ask, you know, as, as just human beings who care about each other, uh, we need to, to ask about the death of Kurt Hennig. We need to ask about the death of Rick Rude. Yeah. Uh, you know, those are some important things that, that, that need to be addressed, and, and somehow uh, they're not. Yeah, I mean, and this also really annoys me, and I was taking a journalism course at the time. Of course, I have my degree now, and I was talking with a teacher about a week after Kurt Hennig died. Mm-hmm. And I was asking the question, how come if a baseball player gets a staph infection that's, you know, played 30 years ago, it's covered in the news, but a professional wrestler, which has a huge fan base, dies? And I couldn't find one article in our local papers at all about it. I know. I know. I know. Uh, there's probably a hundred reasons. Uh, I'm not sure any of them are any good. Uh but uh, I'm sure your journalism professor, uh, you know, had some reasons as well. He was sports editor of the of the Arizona Republic had uh, his or her reasons as well. Uh, I don't know. It, it it should have been covered, and, and it, it it you know the death of of, of Kurt Hennig, and I, I loved Kurt. We were very very good friends. Um, it, it hurt me very much, uh, not only that he died, but uh, but the way in which he died. Uh, and, uh, did you know yeah. that he was, you know, engaging in those activities? I'm sorry? Did you know that he was, you know, enjoying those party materials? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, let's just say I wasn't surprised. Oh, okay. I wasn't surprised. You have to, the thing about wrestling and, and any other sport, uh, you know, you hear the stories about, you know, the NFL and the NBA. I mean, you know, these guys are now getting a, a drug test, at the, you know, all the time. But there's an interesting combination of elements. One is the amount of money these guys make. And, and, and finally, wrestlers are making the same kind of money that, that, that athletes in other sports are making, and that's long overdue. Mm-hmm. So you're making a lot of money. You're on the road. You're away from your family. You've got a lot of time on your hands, and you're always in pain. Mm. That's a bad combination of things. I remember I sat down with uh, Bonnie Steamboat, and Bonnie Steamboat was explaining it to me. Uh, She was telling me, uh, she's actually a good friend of mine, and she was saying, you know, here's the situation when you're a wrestler. You need to take, you're on the road so often that you're in pain, so you need to take painkillers. Then, then you need to get up for the match, because painkillers kind of wear you out, so you take speed. Right. Well, then you need to sleep at night, so you've got to take downers. Mm -hmm. So in the morning, again, you've got to take speed to wake up. And she's like, okay, there's your drugs. <laughs> well, you know, there is that cycle. And then you also mix in the fact that you've got a lot of money, that you're away from your wife and kids, you're, you know, you're away from the people that you love, and you've got nothing but idle time on your hands. Uh, you know, you, you, you go to the gym, you train for a couple hours, you know, you, you go to the arena, uh, but what do you do with the rest of the time? You know, you can only watch so much daytime TV. Uh, it, it's a very dangerous combination of things. And... Uh, for somebody like like a Kurt Hennig or, or really any professional athlete, you know, there's a huge difference between playing playing hurt and playing in pain. You know, most athletes are always playing in pain. Uh, and professional wrestlers, you know, the bumps these guys take, 
know, they're always in pain. And uh, I once heard it said that that bliss is the absence of pain. Huh. And and for these guys to experience that, you know, a lot of times uh, I think any athlete will go to, uh, uh, you know, so, some extremes that uh, society may frown upon. Right. Right. Well, we do appreciate your time here. Do you mind if I just give you a couple of word associations before you let you off, let you off the phone? Sure, go ahead. Um, if you have a one-word answer, that's great. If you want to share uh, a story, that's great, too. Um, okay. All right, how about uh, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes? Legendary. Where did the uh, name Stagger Lee Marshall come from, anyway? Uh, Dusty gave it to me. Okay. And it, it, it's from an old rock and roll song. Oh. That, uh, you know, being an old rock and roll disc jockey, uh, there, there was a song by a man named Lloyd Price, mm -hmm. and the song is Stagger Lee. Oh, okay. And, uh, and uh, the dream just gave me that nickname some time ago, and uh, it's one of those that uh, that stuck. Yeah, that, that's funny, because we were always look for an opportunity to sing. We right. love to sing. I love to sing. Dusty loves to sing. Uh so Disco loves to sing. Uh, Hulk Hogan loves to sing. You know, we'd, we'd go out and... Uh, you know, uh, just look for a place where we could, you know, either sing along or even sometimes commandeer the stage. <laughs> oh. How about Hulk Hogan? Underrated. Uh, certainly not by me. By far, far and away, my uh, favorite of all time. And I, I defend him to the death. <laughs> uh, as, as I do as, as well. Uh, you know, the things that he, uh, that he has done and his family have done, you know, it, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, guys. You know, when, when the guy's on the road, you know, his family's not. So uh, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into, uh, to, uh, you know, being a professional athlete. And, uh, you know, Hogan, uh, I don't really, you know, care what you think of him about him as, 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 a, uh, as a wrestler. The fact is that, uh, that uh, you know, he carried the sport. He, he, he was the... Uh, one of the few people that if you walked up to a person and, and, and you couldn't get them to watch a professional wrestling match at gunpoint, they still knew Hulk, Hulk Hogan. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way it was. And when you see him walking through an arena today, you know, you got, you got five and six-year-old kids who you know don't know who Hogan is or not, not as much, and they don't sit there thinking, who's this old guy coming to the ring? They see, right. you know, this is a superstar. I better appreciate right. him. You know, there's a very different difference. How about, uh, let's switch gears and go back to Tony Schiavone. Misused talent. How about the professor, Mike Tanay? Uh, understated intelligence. <laughs> I got a weird one here for you. I'm not sure if there's going to be anything here, but he's a, a really good guy. We interviewed him over two years ago. How about Scott Hudson? Don't know him that well. Yeah, and I don't think many people do. Uh, how about Diamond Dallas Page? My best friend. Really? Yeah. Had a great opportunity to sit down with uh, Dallas in December. What a great honor that was. Yeah. Great guy. Um, got a couple names left for you, and then we'll let you go. How about Rob Russin? Determined. And I guess the last name I have on the list is Eric Bischoff. Ambitious. You know, I'm going to take that back. I'll throw you one more since we didn't talk about him earlier, but we did talk about Kurt. How about Rick Rude? Rick Rude. Oh, boy. Misunderstood. Yeah. Just truly one of the nicest guys. Mm. One of the nicest men. And, and, and a footnote on Shivani when I said mis misapplied. Tony Shivani is a brilliant play-by-play -play baseball guy. Mm -hmm. And Tony Schiavone should be the voice of the Atlanta Braves, but they'll never give him an opportunity to do that because people associate it with wrestling. Oh. Tony's ten times, ten times better than virtually anybody doing major league play-by-play -play right now. Well, he's got the voice for it, that's for sure. I mean, but uh, that is true, though. When you hear his voice, you think the voice of WCW. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And Wait. Tony's a brilliant baseball guy. Yeah. Well, we really can't thank you enough for your time. Give us one last plug for Wrestle Reunion coming up in August. Wrestle Reunion in August. Be there. <laughs> yeah. Right out of Philadelphia, King of Prussia, Philadelphia. Uh, this is this is the fans' event. This is an opportunity for you to uh, to uh, 
meet and greet and get pictures with and ask questions of. And uh, it's kind of one big locker room, guys. Yeah. Like I said, the locker room was always the best part of the uh, always the best part of professional wrestling. And this three day event is one big locker room, and the fans get to come. Yeah. Oh, wow. We really can't thank you enough for your time, Lee. This was uh, far better than I think either Chuck or I expected. Chuck, would you agree with that? I would. It was, it was definitely a pleasure to sit down and speak with you. My pleasure indeed, James. Chuck, thank you so much. I look forward to speaking with you again. You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. say incompetent and i was gonna leave no it is the incomparable james walsh we have another outstanding show for you guys today we got a raw recap as always and our smackdown coverage as well we also have an interview with a former announcer lee marshall also known as tony the tiger oddly enough and we also have francine uh, even though it's pre-recorded she's still with us here today she is great. We have to apologize, though. We were supposed to be live on location this evening from Impact Zone Wrestling out here in Tempe, Arizona. But unfortunately, our producer kind of skipped out on us on the last minute, and that left us with our current situation. So Evidently. we're here in studio, and feel free to call in the numbers 480-965-1260. That is 480-965-1260. You can talk a little bit of wrestling with the guys. Evidently, there is an I in team. There, There is an I in team. Yeah. So uh, what do we want to do first, man? I think we got to get right into our Francine segment today. Oh, what the hell? Load right. it up. We're, we're going to talk pretty a good. little bit of movies with the Queen of Extreme. She's going to talk about the movies that she's seen, what her favorite movies are, and what she thinks of all the stupid remakes. I think my opinion is pretty clear about this, but we'll get the Queen of Extreme's point of view. for our weekly segment on the Blaze 1260. And we got Francine on the line, James is on the line, I of course am on the line. Francine, how are you doing? Um, I'm great. I'm a little tired from my L.A. trip, but I'm pretty good. How was your L.A. trip? Uh, it was really, really good. Um, I'm going to actually do a diary entry in detail about it, but I met a lot of celebrities and um, saw a lot of fans, and, and it was well worth my time, so I had a good time. Any really good celebrities that we'd be interested in hearing about that you met? Um... You know what? There, there was so many of them there. Um, I actually talked to Frank Stallone a little bit, and he was a really, really nice guy. Um, Mickey Rooney was there. Erin um, Moran from Happy Days was there. She was Joni. Oh, wow. On the show. Um, Priscilla Barnes, who was, uh, I forget her character, but she was in Three's Company. Oh, uh, who is it? Priscilla Barnes? Uh, yeah, she, she was, um, uh, I remember for Christy. Uh, Terry? Yeah, that's Terry. it. She was the nurse. I'm an old guy. <laughs> Sorry. <Me too>. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember her name, but yeah, she was there. I'm um, trying to think off the top of my head. Scotty Schwartz, who I knew from uh, before, he was in The Toy and A Christmas Story. Oh, yeah. um, He was there. Um, a lot of the old-time uh, TV actors and actresses was there, and a lot of Playboy Playmates were there. And everybody kept coming up to me, what month were you? <laughs> and I said, excuse me, because they had, I, I guess, you know, they, they had me sitting kind of with the playmates. And, well, I guess that's a good compliment. And I, I was flattered. I said, no, I'm a professional wrestler, you know. And, oh, get, get out of here, you know. So it was it was nice. I had a lot of people come that knew who I was, you know, just that came to see me. But then the other people that didn't know still bought some stuff because they collect pinups and stuff <laughs> like that. So it was, overall, it was a really good experience. Excellent. Did you bring your camera along for uh, Missy Hyatt and Francine TV? I did not. Ah, okay. I forgot it. Yeah, Missy probably is not happy with you about that, is she? You know why? I she'll get glad again. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Missy just, you know, we'll fight one minute, we'll hug the next. It's fine. <laughs> Excellent. Well, as we talked about last week a little bit, we wanted to discuss something a little bit different, a little outside of the pro wrestling realm of things, if you will. Okay. Um, we wanted to talk about the recent direction of movies. Um, we, we have our forum set up, and it's been a really big topic of conversation. Everyone's saying, you know, oh, I like all the remakes. I don't like all the remakes. I like the comic book movies. I don't like the comic book movies. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think James and I are kind of in agreement that there's been a little lack in productivity in Hollywood for having original storylines. Uh, in, in original movies, it seems like they're all remakes. Right, right. Um, so we wanted to get your take on that and what some of your favorite movies are, um, uh, of even all time. Um, uh, my two favorite movies, you're probably going to laugh at me, but my two favorite movies of all time are Grease hmm? and the 1968 version of Romeo and Juliet. Well. Because I, I will cry from the minute the man, the narrator, talks to the very end. <laughs> That's like my all-time favorite movie. But um, I, I agree with you. There are a lot of remakes. And it's so funny because just being in L.A., like everybody has a script yeah. that, that they created. But not, nothing is being produced because, you know, not everybody's getting a shot. Um, it's who you know. Were they all waiters by chance? You know, no. The, a lot of them were, you know, trying to be actors and... I mean, you know, the place was just flooded with people. Like, Ron Jeremy was, was even walking around. He had to buy a ticket to get in. Really? Oh, yeah, but, he, I mean, he was walking around. It was, it was just so funny. Um, Did he go straight to the Playmates? No. He was just, you know, he was just walking around looking at everything. Just, you know, I guess as a fan, I was told a lot of the, um, Frank Stallone wasn't signing. He had just come in to walk around and look. A lot of those guys are collectors as well. And it wasn't just, um... It wasn't just celebrities sitting around. It was a lot of, like, movie posters and props from movies and stuff. So if you're a collector or a fan of that type of thing, you're, you're going to go to one of these shows as well. Hmm. So a lot of those stars, you know, had just come in to, to look around and get some cool memorabilia or movie posters and stuff like that. Right. Is there any movies you've seen in, say, like the last year that really struck you as a, as a good quality movie? Not really. <laughs> good point. Not real. I mean, the, the most recent movie I just saw was Wedding Crashers, because I'm a huge Vince Vaughn mark. I, I love him. And, um, it, you know, that that's the last movie I saw. And, I, and I, like, I thought it was funny, but it, it didn't blow me away or anything, you yeah. know. And uh, I, I have not really seen a, a really, really good flick in a while. And there's a lot of movies that, like, the build-up for them is so great, and then you watch it, and you're like, oh, God, that sucks. Well, I think War of the Worlds is, like, a perfect example of that. I, I don't know. that got the worst reviews. Well, the movie itself was good, but it's like a two-year-old wrote the ending. Right, right. Every review I've read on that was horrible. Like, don't waste your time, don't waste your money, don't watch it, mm. you know? So I, I can't think of a good movie that's probably even come out since, like, the mid-'90s, really. Well, you're, you're a little tougher than I am. I'll tell you what, though. I am sick of all the remakes. I went to go see Against My Will, Willy Wonka. And, you know, I grew up in that generation, so, you know, Gene Wilder's version was incredible to me. And I watched this thing, and it's just so... It's like watching a remake. It's like watching somebody cover a song. It's just not the same. Let me ask you this. Was it very similar to the original, or did they tweak it for today's... They, they tweaked it a little bit for today's audience. For example, like, instead of having a bunch of Oompa Loompas, there's just one that they digitally redid so that it looked like there's a lot of them. Oh. Um, there's not quite as many songs which is kind of a letdown in my opinion. But ultimately, they kept it the same. I had heard they were going to go really freaky with it, which I was glad they didn't. But I don't know. I just think the original was just so good. It didn't really even need to be remade. Well, don't you think with Johnny Depp being uh, the lead character that is going a little freaky with it to some degree? Well, you know what? I think Johnny Depp is a great actor. I think he can play any role, and when he plays a role, he plays it well. But, you know, you get Johnny Depp, and then you look at Gene Wilder. Right. You know, it's such a contrast. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to say he's a bad actor. I just don't know if he's the guy that you want representing a film that's designed for kids to some degree. It just seems a little creepy to me. I think it just proves that he's an over-around, uh, all-around, you know, good actor. I mean, he could play, uh, to me, I think he could just play any role, and he, and he does it well. I have not seen the movie yet. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I told you this last week, I just saw Willy Wonka for the, the original for the first time last year. <laughs> You know what I mean? So uh, eventually I'll see this, because I have 14 nieces and nephews, so I'm sure we'll get the the DVD or something when it comes out. And then you watch it a thousand times over and over again? Yeah, well, you know, that's what kids do. I mean, I'm babysitting right now, and I'm trying to uh, talk to you guys and and discipline them at the same time. uh, (laughs) um, Yeah, so anyway, I, yeah, I, I, you know, there there hasn't been a movie that I could not wait to see in a long time. I remember, um, what was the one, uh, the, the horror movie, um, with the three people, um, that, uh, the video camera, it was supposed to be like a shoot. The Blair Witch Project. Yeah, yes. I couldn't even remember the name. I was so excited to go see that, and I went to the theater, and I just sat there and was not scared for a second. I thought it was the most horrible movie. <laughs> then I got pumped up for The Ring. I thought The Ring was horrible. I'm a big horror movie fan. 
Hmm. You know, so my next thing I'm going to go is uh, Rob Zombie. Did you see the uh, original film of that, um, House of the House? Uh, excuse me, House of a Thousand Corpses. Yes. Now, did you like? That? I loved it. Isn't that like the most interesting camera work you've seen in some I, time? I thought it was just awesome. I thought the characters were just unique and crazy, and it, it was just, uh, it, you know, it was just, it was so nutty. Like you, sometimes you couldn't even follow it, but I didn't even care because it was so nutty. <laughs> uh, like uh, I have a minor in, in film production. Uh huh. Uh, and sitting there watching that film, uh, I'd say that the storyline probably wasn't like the strongest thing I've ever seen in my life, but the mm -hmm. actual camera work that they did with interjecting like these old school vignettes and, and having, you know, these really slow motion shots of things that you know, seem to last an eternity, but really like led up to a strong point. It, it's something different that I hadn't seen in, in a while, which is what made the film so good. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that one. So uh, I'm actually, I haven't really been around that much to go see another movie, but the next movie I see is definitely going to be that one. It, it looks, you know, to be great, and, and like you said, the characters are good, and that one still has, you know, the majority of the same cast back. Right. So it, it should be good. Let me ask you about another kind of horror movie. It's a little more drama than horror. But what do you think about the movie Seven? Have you ever seen that? You know what? I have not seen that. Oh, Francine, you gotta I get that. You know, it's so funny because uh, getting back to this weekend again, uh, my friend Britt was with me, and he was pointing out different people and everything like you know this is so and so from this show and this is so and so i didn't know anybody and uh, when it came to movies he's like have you been living under a rock <laughs> he's like you don't know anybody and i was like well i said you know I, I really i really am not home to actually go to the theater so i rent a lot of movies mm -hmm. but i you know there's there's a lot of things i still haven't seen like there was one gentleman there from ghostbusters Oh, see, now I'm the only person on the planet that's never seen those. I saw it when I was a kid, and I couldn't, I couldn't tell you anything about it. I mm. was, uh, they drug me to see The Phantom Menace, which I enjoyed, but I, I had no prior recollection of any of the Star Wars movies, so, <laughs> you know. Let me ask you this. This is my favorite horror movie of all time. Perhaps it's just because it's so cheesy that it's funny. Have you ever seen Stephen King's It? No, I have not. You all have? I did see Killer Clowns from Outer Space. <laughs> which is very enjoyable, but I'm really scared of clowns, so it freaked me out. Hey, now, let me ask you this. Is that kind of a, a female, like, phobia thing that goes around? Because basically every girl I've dated in my life has a phobia of clowns. I don't know. I, they're, they're so freaky. Even the sweetest-looking clown is a potential psycho killer to me. I hate clowns. Then don't see it. <laughs> I just hate You know what it is? Growing up in, in like, the, the tri-state area, of, you know, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, you go to the Jersey Shore, Mm -hmm. And on the boardwalk, they have this thing called Bozo. He sits in a dunk tank. Mm -hmm. He is the most vile, mean-spirited man ever. Because, you know, he wants you to come up and, and dunk him. You throw the balls at the little target or whatever. Mm -hmm. He says the meanest things to you, and my fear might have triggered from him. <laughs> from really? passing him. Oh, you're stupid. You're ugly. You're that. Bah, bah, bah. And, he's just so, and he has this real deep, raspy voice. Yeah. Does this remind you, you of anything? You hear him from miles. You just keep walking down, and you still hear him. And he's just so scary and... You know, and then Doink, Doink scared me. <laughs> Doink the clown years scared later, I worked with him in ECW. <laughs> he was an evil-looking clown. I just don't like clowns. Does this remind you of anything? Watch the tram car, please. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Have you been there? Uh, I grew up in New Jersey. Oh, okay. I was there every summer for like 20 years. Yeah. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I know exactly. I've been. I know exactly where it is, and uh, I was not exactly afraid of it, but I saw a lot of kids scur scurrying away in a hurry. So he's annoying. <laughs> he's mean spirited, and he's very annoying. And you know, I've never gave him a dime of my money because <laughs> I used to always run from him. <laughs> well, there you go, folks. You've heard it here first. Francine has been scarred by a clown. <laughs> I don't like clowns. No, not really. Well, excellent, Francine. We thank you for your time here today. We will, of course, speak with you next week. I don't know what the topic of next week's discussion is going to be yet. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Do you have any bookings for this weekend? Uh, this weekend, I'm actually off, and I am doing something with my friends. So That's I'm very excited about that. Well, you enjoy this time off. I am going to, and uh, you guys get all your work done. And, um, you know, surprise me next week. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is the coach, Jonathan Coulter from the WWE, and of course, you're listening to the Interactive Interview.
course you are. You're listening to the interactive interview, also known as the Wrestling Epicenter, here on the Blaze 1260 AM. Check us out on the web at www.wrestlingepicenter.com. Join the damn forums. Later on in the program, we're going to be joined once again by Lee Marshall. But you can get a phone call in in just a few minutes at 480-965-1260. And I believe you have a caller right now. Brian, you on the line, brother? Yes, I am. What's you're, going on, man? Uh, we're getting ready to discuss a little bit of Raw. Raw. Oh, what a stinker it was. Are you serious? Yes. All right, we're going to get your opinions on why in just a minute. But first, I want to go through our typical rundown. We obviously had to hit uh, Chris Jericho start off the show. Um, it talks for a long time, it seemed like, um, uh, about how he's exposed John Cena as a bad worker and as a thug and a fraud. Um, and, and, you know, how he's going to take his title at SummerSlam. I think it topped Shawn Michaels' promo from last week as shoot promo of the week. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You... Well, he was right about everything except for uh, taking the title. Well, I, I don't see him taking the title. I have to agree with you there. But I, I didn't really like this promo. I enjoyed the HBK promo last week, as I said. This promo really didn't do it for me. Um I think maybe the, the security coming out to separate them and, and Bischoff being out there really just kind of seemed too much. Um, I, I like it when, when promos are one-on-one. -on -one. You know, you kind of get a personal feeling going on there. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of like it whenever they get the security guards in there. It makes it a little uh, – it makes you want to see the match more when they can't touch each other. Yeah, may, maybe it, uh, that's just not my style, though. What do you think, Walsh? I think it's fine. I think it's also a way that you can get indie workers on TV and nobody knows it. You know, those were all indie guys that were working that were there last night. On yeah, the, we are. I believe it was Xavier was one of them, actually. Well, why don't we get into the first match of the night? Because this is what, what made Raw better for me, was that we saw a lot of matches in the first hour, something that we're not accustomed to seeing as of the last three or four weeks. Um, we had uh, Shelton Benjamin come out, um, wow. al along with the big show, and he took on uh, Chris Masters as well as Gene Snitsky. Um, what did you guys think of this match? Uh, I thought it was okay for a, uh, a tag match. Uh, it went a little, it went long, which is, it kind of surprised me. Right. Uh, Two man, segments. What a kick in the face of uh, whoever Sheldon Benjamin and Big Show were facing. I forget. It was uh, uh, Chris Matthews. That I knew that was Gene Snitsky. You know who I'm talking. You, know, you know what I'm talking about? That spin kick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, was... you could just hear that crack. Yeah, I mean, that was one hell of a spot. That's one of the few spots that uh, Shelton's actually hit over the past couple months. But it was good to see. Uh, nice spot. I think the big show works well with little guys, making a good tag team partner. I think for a couple weeks there, he did the stuff with Ray. So, I mean, he's able to do things with them that other tag team partners could not do. It was a fair match. I enjoyed it. I I, I, I'll tell you what. You know, I, I did actually enjoy it, and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I enjoy watching Snitsky get slapped around by Big Show for, for the first five minutes of the match. That, that was, you know, entertaining to me. Um, I, I also feel like uh, it's, it kind of helped uh, Chris Masters along a little bit. Um, you know, him and Big Show are going to be entering their feud for SummerSlam here momentarily. And uh, it's a good way to get them close to each other, build up some heat, but not to get too close and ruin the buildup for their SummerSlam match. Plus, Chris Masters did not lose yet. This is true. But let's move right along to our next match, which is, of course, the Eugene Invitational, I guess is what we're calling it. Obviously, Kurt Angle came out, wanted to take him out in a match. Um, What's your name and where are you from? But but it wasn't his... What's your name and where are you from? It wasn't, it wasn't his uh, hometown. <laughs> his hometown... A return from uh, a WWE legend, I guess, if you want to call him that, was uh, Tatanka. <laughs> Tatanka. I was really not excited to see Tatanka come back. I thought there were so many other people that could have been used in this kind of spotlighted event. Um, even though if it was a WWE talent that jobbed, um, I think it would have got, you know, someone that's currently on the roster, someone that can currently work, uh, you know, some much-needed airtime. Anybody remember Tatanka's song from the Superstars album? Tatanka, Buffalo. I don't know why that stuck out in my head. Um, it was interesting, if nothing else. It was, it was a fun promo, fun little thing to see Tatanka back in there. It looked like he gained a little bit of weight, but he posted on his official website last night and early this morning that he's interested in making a full return to the ring. Uh, he won't. Uh, but I did enjoy uh, seeing Tatanka again. I used to uh, play with him all the time on, uh, what was that, Super Nintendo game? Royal Rumble? Yeah, that's it, that's it. That was the first really good wrestling video game, in my opinion. Yeah, that was that was actually the only good wrestling game for a long time. Yeah, I mean, Raw was pretty much the same game as... Well, yeah, it was like a sequel. Yeah, well, yeah. 
Well, uh, the next segment we're going to go to is, of course, when Vince McMahon came out um, and, and talked to the fans about how he only does things that are good for business. And this, of course, led back to the, the final um, confirmed rehiring uh, of Matt Hardy. And I thought Matt Hardy went on to cut a pretty good promo. I think they should have done this sooner um, in this little angle to have going on. I think the the response of the crowd was a little bit lackluster. Um, I think seeing him, you know, kind of get beat up by security for the last three weeks kind of hurt the the potential the segment had. Um, but, but when Matt Hardy spoke, it seemed like he was speaking the truth. He was speaking emotionally. I, and I, uh, I, I'm surprised as hell to hear him say, uh, Edge, I hope you die in a car wreck. <laughs> That was one hell of an interesting promo, but I will say this. I'm glad to see him back on Row, whatever the hell Row is. He did not say Raw once. He said Row about 18 times. Row. I'm glad to be back on Row. <laughs> Chuck's staring at me right now. Uh, I thought it was... Uh, I, I wonder how many WWE fans out there were, or even in uh, TV land, just kind of confused about... I mean, they just kind of, you know, basically said WWE is fictional, you know, with the whole Kane thing and everything. Yeah, that's so. that's a really good point. I don't know how good how smart that is to break kayfabe. I remember, this reminds me of something in 1998 when Larry Zbysko was talking about the death of Louis Piccoli. And they had a feud going on on TV, and even after the guy died, Zbysko called him a jerk. So I was thinking to myself, shouldn't he have said something like, you know, he wasn't that bad of a guy or something like that, even though he died? Uh... No, he just called him a flat-out jerk. I mean, I don't know. I think that could, that's crossing the boundaries of kayfabe um, way too hard. I think it's kind of making everybody, everything else on the show seem a little bit silly. However, I am glad that they did tell the entire story because there's a lot of people sitting at home that don't have access to the Internet that don't know the whole story. I wonder what's going to happen with Kane now. Well, I think, this, like James said, I think it was imperative they told the whole story. And I think we've all been waiting to hear what Matt Hardy has to say, how he feels on it. And I've never heard him speak on the mic better, in my opinion. Um, what, what he said really flowed. Um, and he came across as a very good talker, something that I would not necessarily uh, mention when I'm referring to Matt Hardy, the worker or wrestler. Hear Hardy flow on row. <laughs> but uh, this led us to our next match, which was none other than Val Venus, one of my personal favorites, even though he doesn't really get any kind of pushes these days. He's still a tremendous worker, a tremendous athlete. And he took on uh, the, the new Rob Conway. What was his new nickname, James? The Con Man. The Con Man Conway. Is he supposed to be gay now or something? I think he's trying to go... I, no, I don't think it's a gay gimmick so much as I think it's a, a kind of uh, cheap ripoff of Brett the Hitman Hart. Because he's like Rob the, what? the Con Man Conway. Uh, yeah, I, that's just how it feels to me. How, how is that uh, anything mm. like Brett the Hitman Hart? Well, let me ask you this. Has Conway conned anybody yet? No. Has Hitman put a hit on anybody yet? No. <laughs> no. Not that I know of. I mean, I think it just could be that way. Plus, I wouldn't have made the connection had they not done that interview with Rob Conway on WWE.com a couple weeks back where he says that he wants to be the next version of Bret Hart. So, I don't know. I, I, just something I'm throwing out at the fences and that Chuck and I uh, seem to agree on that maybe they're trying to do that. It wasn't a ripoff. I do like the new finisher. I do think that it's... A interesting move, Bull Payne in the old uh, Global Federation used to do a move very similar to that. I'm very glad to see a move that involves somebody actually laying across the ropes, because that looks like it's pretty sick and it looks pretty dangerous. Instead of talking so much about Rob Conway, I want to talk about Val Venus for a minute, because every time Val Venus has a match, no matter who it's against, his opponent looks like gold. And this was a similar thing that happened last night. Conway came out uh, of that match looking like a phenomenal technical wrestler. And everyone seems to overlook um, the, the, the fact of selling and people being able to take moves very well. Uh, obviously, Val Venus has a lot of talent, and I still think they should repackage him and use him. People say his time has come and gone. I disagree. I think the guy has a lot to offer. I think you bring him off TV for a little while, have him come back six months to a year um, with a whole different character. Obviously, Chief Morley was a bad idea. Um, the porn star gimmick has come and gone. It's run its course. There's something else out there for Val Venus, and they need to find it for him because he's a great talent, a great worker. He could be another Intercontinental Champion. Uh, um, again, he's already had the belt once, and I think he deserves another run with it. Maybe in a uh, different federation or something. I don't think WWE is going to ever do anything with him ever again because the creative team just isn't creative. 
Uh, that's the way they put it. However, I think it's a testament to his talent that he still has a job when after those twenty guys got released last month. Yeah, I thought he. I thought for sure he was going to be on that list. Well, I mean, he's what we'd call in the old days a good hand. He, he's a guy that can go out there and make people look good, and at the end of the day, still look like the paycheck. Well, I think that the WWE uses him in a fashion in which he knows he's not going to get pushed, which upsets me personally because I think they should. But, you know, he wrestles a lot of dark matches. He wrestles a lot of heat matches. Um, he is kind of like a, a talent scout in a way for the WWE um, in ring. You know, he'll yeah, work... like the uh, Brooklyn Brawler used to be. Yeah, he'll work with people. He'll go back to Vince and, and give him a quick report on how he felt, you know, that guy could work, you know, what his potential is, if there's any upside, any downside. Um, and and I, I don't see him losing his job. I think he'll end up being a road agent eventually down the line. He's what we call a good hand, like I said. But, uh, I, I, I call him a jobber. I'm interested to hear guys' opinion about the next segment. Um, I personally loved it. Uh, I don't often say that about segments that I see in Raw, but uh, HBK, I thought, did a phenomenal job last night, at, you know, trying to emulate the immortal Hulk Hogan. I thought it was hysterical. He looks like a really, really scrawny Hulk Hogan. It's kind of and funny, I thought. I, I don't like the mockery of Hogan, but I, taking a step back off my soapbox and being Hogan Mark, I will say that I thought it was a funny parody of him. And I think the funniest part of this segment, which nobody talked about online, which I don't know why, maybe it's because I have a warped sense of humor, was when Michaels all of a sudden super kicked Larry King in the face. He didn't hit him. What do you mean? <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Yeah, what do you mean it didn't hit him? It didn't hit him. Was it blatantly unclose? Yeah, it was pretty blatant. Really? And he, and he just kind of went back and just fell over. It didn't even hit him. It just totally took me out of the entire segment. It didn't come across that way, I don't think, to either James or I. I mean, it obviously didn't. I mean, we all know he's not, you know, really kicking the crap out of him. But uh, it didn't look like that much space between the kick and uh, Larry's uh, face. Uh, I rewind the tape, dude. Check it out again. I'm telling you. you it, it, so. his, his foot did not even touch his nose. Well, I mean, obviously he's not going to kick an old guy in the head. <laughs> well, no, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I thought it was an interesting segment. I do think that if they do keep doing promos like this, where Michaels continually hits bullseye and bullseye and brags on Hogan for all of his flaws, real and not real, Hogan has to defend himself, otherwise the fans are going to turn on Hogan, or at least a portion of them will, and go to Michaels' side. Well, uh, uh, James and I have been throwing this around. We think that it's kind of ridiculous at this point in time that Hogan has been off TV for as long as he has. Well, I mean, he's there to promote Hogan Knows Best, plain and simple. Well, he still needs to be on TV to do that adequately, in my opinion. Especially if they're going to make the Hogan-Michaels match the main event of the evening like they did say last week. I don't think it will be. Well, they they claim it will be, and I, I don't necessarily see a reason why it wouldn't be. Um, are they going to show Batista and JBL again as the main event? Well, I mean, what does that say about your world champions? Well, that, it, it, it's something that, that's a match, though, that's been waiting to happen for both of these men's entire careers. Well, yeah, I'll give you that, but still, it's... Uh... Cena Jericho doesn't scream main event to me, and neither does Batista JBL. I think Batista against Muhammad Hassan potentially could have been the main event of the evening, but because they rolled over and died on that one, uh, yeah. that's not yeah. going to happen. Well, and, and you know, to to headline a pay per view with, with a match that had just happened no more than you know three four weeks ago, um, and, and we're still going to yield the same outcome. I mean, I cannot foresee Batista dropping the strap at this point in time. Yeah, that's true, that's true. I mean, I don't, it would be, seem kind of anticlimactic well, for the whole evening. Do you think he'll keep it to uh, WrestleMania? I don't really see anyone that can take that belt off of Batista in the near future. The only feasible thing that I could see is, is maybe him dropping the strap to The Undertaker for a, a month. Um, is Undertaker's last run as WWE Champion before he steps down. Um, somewhere down the line before next WrestleMania. I think I'd save that for No Way Out and then have uh, Undertaker's t last title defense and first loss at WrestleMania be at WrestleMania. Well, well either way, I, I, what I'm saying is that's the only scenario that I can play out in my head where I see Batista losing the belt. I don't think there's what anyone else. What about Randy Orton? Well, Randy Orton's going to be tied up in a feud, obviously, w with Undertaker that I would expect to span yeah, but, a mean, few pay-per-views. The storylines go so fast, it's going to be just like one month. This is going to be one the next pay-per-view, the... What, the uh, what is the next pay-per-view for SmackDown? Perhaps No Mercy? I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's not Unforgiven, important. No Mercy, something along those lines. There's just so many of them right now. It's, right. it's uh, impossible. It's impossible for somebody in the middle-class tax bracket to possibly afford to order all of these pay-per-views. <laughs> it's just physically not possible. 
And, and then you got I, TNA I, I and think XWF I, and UFC and all these other pay-per-views. I, I think that maybe Orton could take the strap from him. I just don't feel like it's Orton's time. He's been off TV for too long. Well, I didn't think Orton was going to beat Benoit back in the day either, but it happened. Well, Orton doesn't have that same kind of mega push going on. or, or that Well, he's fans, not even on TV. Right, and the fans really behind him. It's going to take time. Um, and, and I think the WWE may be a little hesitant to put the title back on him. Um, he's been relatively injury-prone over his uh, short career, and I think they want to have him work for a time and, and prove that he can carry the strap and, and be a little more durable than he currently is. Yeah, I think he should uh, go. I think they should put him in that uh, U.S. title bracket because Orlando Jordan is not cutting it. And I think somebody like Randy Orton, Chris Benoit can, you know, really bring some prestige back to that title because that title is dead. As well, a matter of fact, all the titles are dead except for heavyweight. Indeed. And they're about half in the grave, I mean, one foot in the grave. Especially for the tag team division, which we haven't seen the tag team champions defend their titles in what I would say is about two months. But you know what? This is going to be great for TNA because whenever they get on TV and they're going to have such good tag team matches, X division matches, I think they're really going to start. I think they're really going to push themselves. I'm really trying to get excited for TNA. I can't say that I am right now. I'm trying very hard, and I hope that they do make it. Don't well, well Brian, listen, we got to get you off the horn here, buddy. we got to continue on with our Raw recap. Right. We appreciate you calling in, and hopefully we'll speak to you next week, my man. All right, sure. Have a good one, brother. All right, That's later. Brian from WrestlingEpicenter.com, the new boy doing our news. Good job, Brian. We appreciate it very much. So uh, we, we talked a little bit last night about the Raw Diva Search segment and how it was moderately more entertaining because uh, – Obviously, we had a Deuce Bigelow, male gigolo out there. Yes, uh, we did. Tell us why you thought the Divas segment was a little bit better, James. I thought it was better because we had Deuce Bigelow, male gigolo out there, and it was a bit of chaos. Instead of it just being usual, you had segments where he grabbed the girl's legs out from under her and tackled her, and then she tackled him, and it was made for chaos. You're like, what the hell's going on? What's that? And it was funny. It was funny. And at this point in time, we have another caller on the air, Albert. My man, you called in last week. You're hooking us up again with some good calls. So, uh, Albert, if you're with us, man, what do you want to talk about today, my man? Um, you know, I want to talk about, I think it's almost like I'm surprised, and I think uh, you'll be surprised when I hear it, when you hear it. But ever since Triple H has been off Raw, it's been way worse. It's been way worse? I think a little bit that worse, yeah. I, I kind of tend to agree with you, maybe, Albert. That, that is kind of a good point. I don't know if it's necessarily a coincidence or because he's not there, but, yeah, I think it's been a... Uh been lack a little something. You know, I think it has. Uh, it's been hard to put the finger on it exactly because we've been kind of ripping on Raw for the last three weeks. I think last show was uh, last night's show well, was a step in the right direction. Well, last night's show had two really good things. The Shawn Michaels segment I heard you guys talk about, and then the and that Hardy interview I thought delivered. But it, it the did. rest of it, you know, I mean, 15 minutes of uh, a Snitsky and Chris Masters in a tag team match. Well, well we again, I, I think the whole purpose of that is just to try and set it up for Chris Masters versus the Big Show at SummerSlam. Uh, yeah. And it was just a way to kind of get them more interacting with each other. I don't think the WWE necessarily has enough faith in either of these individuals to let them cut, a, you know, long-winded promos on each other. Um, so they, they kind of have to work it at another angle, and that's why they have them, you know, kind of coming together in the ring. I, I tend to agree with you. I think the match went too long. Um, and it, it seems kind of odd to some degree um, that, that you see Snitsky and Chris Masters together. They don't really seem like a unit that would gel. You know, you know what I mean? No. Well, they're both uh, bad. Better than that, yeah. But, uh, so you did like the uh, HBK segment last night, huh, Albert? Yeah, I thought that was real good. And uh, not only was it funny, but, you know, he had little, you know, insider-type comments about, you know, Hulk Hogan backstage. Like you guys were saying, I mean, really – for most intents and purposes, it seems like HBK is the face in this feud. It, it kind of does because, yeah. you know, you heard a lot of people, in the, you know, in the background noise last night laughing and kind of applauding Shawn Michaels as this was yes, all going on. And that's my biggest fear is that he's going to turn into the face because Hogan's not there to defend himself. That's your biggest fear? About this feud, oh, yes. Okay. I, mean, I you thought you meant in general. Yeah, that is his biggest fear in life that Hogan will not be over. <laughs> oh, don't, then I've had nothing to worry about. <laughs> But, yeah, I think Hogan needs to be on TV. You know, if they're trying to push this as a main event of SummerSlam, you know, you got to have someone that can put in a little time into this feud, you know, and make it big. Yes, yeah. I, I'd agree with that. I think Michaels was hysterical in that role. I think that Hogan has to come back uh, next week and cut a pretty damn good promo in order to capture that audience and keep that audience on his side. 
Otherwise, it could end up being 50-50, and that's not what they want. I think it'll be interesting, though. I just kind of like when the fans react, you know, the opposite of how they're supposed to act. It makes the the, the situation feel like a little more chaotic. Right, like with Hogan Rod in Toronto. In, in, indeed. But what did you think of that Diva segment last night, uh, Albert, with uh, Rob Snyder out there? Do you think that helped a little bit? I kind of think it did. I thought it was moderately amusing. It was faster, yeah. and, and it was funny to see him out there. And it was and a good... Rob Snyder, I mean, you know, I, mean, I don't think he's that funny, but he seems to kind of understand that, you know, not to take the Diva Series thing very seriously, and he was kind of, you know, goofing with it, and it, it was a little bit better. It was the I was first... I see my gal Elizabeth win. I've uh, been rooting for her, I think. Oh, come on now. you got to jump on the bandwagon of Ashley, my man. You know, not... Ashley, uh, she's okay. She's okay. See, I, I, she's, she's, she's my pick right there, man. I, I, I don't think... like Crystal ever since the, the painting thing. Yeah, I don't really like either. I don't know how she keeps making it each week. I, I don't know either. I think we're going to see a situation where both Ashley and Elizabeth get signed. And Layla, I don't, yeah, I'm not a fan of either. Yeah. I don't want any of them to I know it sounds bad that I'm saying I like the two blondes and the two that are, you know, like, minorities I'm, I'm rooting against. But well, you know, hey, that's Incidentally, incidentally, yeah. <laughs> All right, Albert, we appreciate you calling in, buddy. We appreciate you listening to the show, and uh, hopefully we'll get a, a chance to speak with you next week, my man. All right, talk to you later. Have a good one, bro. The phones are hopping this week, everybody. You can be a part of the fun by calling in at 480-965-1260. We're waiting for your call right But we got to move in right now to our Raw main event, man. We've spent like event. 20 minutes on Raw here tonight. Woo! Unbelievable. We obviously had uh, Cena taking on Carlito for the second week in a row with uh, Chris Jericho as the special guest referee. Um, it, it basically was a two-on-three handicap, or a two-on-one, excuse me, handicap match throughout the whole thing. Um, but what really did it for me was, and it perhaps kind of made this feud, was that Cena got busted open. I believe that's the first time I've ever seen him get busted open. And I'm not trying to say that I'm all about the blood and guts here, but it really added kind of a personal element of hatred to this feud that I think was lacking. Before, it kind of seemed like, you know, two boy bands trying to fight each other. You know, oh, well, my I Love You song is better than, you know, yours Let's Go and Party song, you know, Backstreet Boys versus O-Town or something ridiculous like that. Um, uh, this added some much needed, like, the battle intensity. Of the, bar- the Battle of the Barbershop Quartets. Yeah, uh, this definitely added some intensity. What uh, do I mean by that? If you're a band and you don't play instruments, you're a barbershop quartet. I mean, uh, obviously, it, uh, you didn't expect Cena to drop the strap, which he didn't. But uh, I think this definitely furthered the match for, for Cena and, and Jericho at SummerSlam. Um, a match that I'm now actually kind of looking forward to. At first, I didn't really care. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen Jericho in the main event in so long or Push as a top talent. Don't get used to it. I, I'm not going to get used to it. But but to actually, you know, have him out there, you know, bust somebody open good, um, it gives him a little more credibility. But that's all the time we got for Raw this evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go take a quick break, come back with an interview with Lee Marshall, former announcer for WCW. Make sure you keep it locked right here to the Wrestling Epicenter on the Blaze. 12:60 a.m. This is Bruno San Martino, and you're listening to the interactive interview. Just now we have Lee Marshall refereeing on the phone. Lee, it's great to speak with you. How are you doing today, buddy? Oh, I've had a bad day. I'm doing really well, really well. Good to speak with you guys. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Well, let's get right into the questions. Sure. How did you get hooked up with the Wrestle Reunion? Oh, well, uh, through uh, some people that I've known throughout the years, uh, Sal Corrente, who uh, primarily is the, the creator and the promoter of, uh, of Wrestle Reunion, and, and Rob Russin, who I worked with back in the old AWA days, and uh, they uh, contacted me and asked to if I'd be a participant, and I said, well, absolutely, I'd be honored to. I wasn't able to make the first one, but I you know, was able to juggle schedules around, so I'd be able to do the one in Pennsylvania coming up. Mm, excellent. Uh, excellent. Big fans of Rob Rustin here on the interactive interview. Yeah. Uh, Rob's, Rob's one of the best, one of the best. He's a good friend to have, as I always tell everybody. You know it. Absolutely. Um, you just mentioned the AWA. What was it like working under the incomparable Vern Gagne? Uh, you know, pretty interesting, because... Uh, uh, you know, I've been I've been doing this a long time. Ironically, I know you guys are based in Phoenix, and I I started my radio career in Phoenix, mm-hmm. and that's where I first uh, uh, did professional wrestling as well uh, in 1968, I think. Uh, wow, something like that. Uh, at the old uh, Phoenix Madison Square Garden. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that even exists anymore. Probably not. Probably not. But you know, starting there and. Uh, 
you know, work in the territories like, uh, you know, like the wrestlers did. And, uh, was actually working for the WWF when they first started, uh, you know, making a national push. And I got uh, a, a call from Vern Gagne, who uh, actually I got a call from Red Bastien, who uh, I'm sure many of the uh, wrestling historians might recall Red. Yep. And he said, you know, Vern really wants to talk to you about, uh, about doing play-by-play on the wrestling shows that are going to go on ESPN, which seemed pretty exciting because it was, at the time, the first network broadcast of professional wrestling. So I said, yeah, why not? So uh, I actually left the WWF and uh, and went to the AWA and did uh, did commentary for, as you said, the incomparable Vern Gagne and that organization for uh, for some time. And it was great, great fun. Mm-hmm. What radio station do you work with out here in Phoenix? I, I don't even know that it, it exists anymore. It was uh, called KLIZ, Chris, and it was located at 1230 on the AM dial, the dirty 1230. And uh, back in the day, you know, we, we were the we were the top rock and roll station, and our main competition was KRUX, <laughs> which uh, was thirteen sixty, I think. <laughs> I don't even know what they're doing now. And uh, it was it was uh, quite interesting. You know, I'd, I'd uh, started as I said, started my career in in, in Phoenix in nineteen sixty four. I was a sophomore in high school. I just moved from uh, you know being I was born and raised in Hollywood and uh, moved to Phoenix when I was uh, a teenager, and went to Central High School in Phoenix, Arizona, and, and uh, started my career when I was a sophomore. They hired me to do the 7 to Midnight show on uh, on a radio station there. Excellent. Excellent. Bobby Heenan had a couple uh, adjectives or names for the AWA. One of them was All the World's Assholes, and another, <laughs> and another one was the Alzheimer's Wrestling Association. Um, <laughs> Why do you think the AWA did not ultimately um, make it? I mean, I know it did for many years, but why did it close up shop? Uh, it, probably a multitude of reasons. Uh, you know, you have to remember that the AWA, you know, for quite a while was the top organization. It, it had, uh, you know, more shows, more, more cities, more markets, you know, more everything that, than any other organization. Absolutely. And uh, very simply refused to change with the times. You know, Vince McMahon, love him or hate him, uh, you know, sort of the Charlie O. Finley of professional wrestling in a lot of ways, uh, came up with some ideas. You know, e- even something as, as, as simple as, uh, as music when the wrestlers were making their way to the ring. You know, nobody ever did that before. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, there were some, you know, hardliners in the AWA that that always maintained that that the wrestling would uh, be much more appealing than the gimmickry. Hmm. Well, I'm not saying that everybody else was just gimmickry, but they managed to combine, uh, you know, superior wrestling and superior gimmickry, and and uh, the AWA fell by the wayside. Hmm. Another announcer that was working with you in the AWA was Eric Bischoff, who ended up being in charge of WCW in a turn of events that nobody understands. How did Eric end up being in charge of the WCW? Uh, you know, Eric, you know, I'd like to say I taught him everything he knows. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, Eric, Eric really was kind of, I was his mentor as an announcer. And uh, Eric was uh, given the opportunity to go to the WCW uh, as an announcer, and he, uh, you know, went to Atlanta, and, uh, you know, Eric, Eric was one of those guys, and this is probably a good lesson in any kind of business, I suppose, Eric wanted to know everything there was about the business, not just the wrestling part of it, and the booking part of it, and, you know, the, the matchmaking part of it, but he wanted to understand the television end of it, the production side of it, the business side of it, and he really became a student of the entire business, and, uh, with that, he, uh, you know, managed to uh, to uh, get the attention of some people within the WCW at the time. Uh, you know, most obviously Ted Turner, and uh, he uh, uh, became the man in charge of WCW. Wow! How did you end up uh, signing with WCW? Uh, Eric had, uh, for some time, had wanted me to you know come back and work, and I said, no, you know, I'm I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to move to Atlanta. I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, you know, I live in LA. I, I, I do a lot of things out here. And uh, it just wasn't anything I wanted to do. And he, he finally said, look, how about if you don't move from L.A. and you just, you know, fly to all the events and, and, uh, and like that? Well, we, we came to an agreement, and, uh, and uh, I did that for, uh, for five years. 
until finally uh, you know, I had some some production uh, things I was doing in L.A., and, and i got to tell you, the travel just wore me out. Uh, it actually at one time became a health issue for me. Uh, wow. But uh, I couldn't be on the road that much because I have some some other obligations. One is that, you know, for the past six years, I've been fortunate enough to be the voice of Tony the Tiger, and, and that's pretty demanding as far as schedule. That's and, great. Uh, uh, I just couldn't be on the road constantly. So... Uh, I left WCW, and, and uh, uh, shortly thereafter, I guess, they, uh, you know, they merged or did whatever they did with, uh, with uh, WWE, and uh, I had a wonderful time with WCW. It gave me a chance to work with some guys that I'd worked with uh, you know, over, over the years. Well, speaking of the traveling, what was it like traveling with Bobby the Brain Heaton behind the scenes? Can you share us uh, a few <laughs> stories? <if> you <laughs> it depends on, uh, on on the rating of the show, guys. Uh, no, Bo- Bobby was uh, Bobby was always great fun to be around. Uh, you know, we we supposedly had uh, uh, a feud. You know, there was the Bobby Heenan Lee Marshall feud, and and that was uh, uh, really nothing more than than an angle that. Uh, that somebody came up with. We were very, very close friends, have been for many, many, many years. And it was always uh, fun to travel with Bobby uh, because he, he's a pretty quirky guy, and I guess I am too, and, you know, you know, you guys probably are too. Uh, Bobby always uh, had, a, had a thing for wanting to get back to the hotel right away. And he always hated it when I drove because I had absolutely no sense of direction. Zero. I'm, I'm just the worst. And I'd also at uh, one time underwent uh, the laser eye surgery. So uh, there was a time where my, especially at night, uh, my vision was a little, not blurry, but, you know, you get those little halos and whatever. So uh, he was actually uh, not happy to drive with me. And my position was, hey, it really doesn't matter where we're going, Brain. You know, everything's an adventure. We don't have to be back to the hotel right away. And uh, it, was, it was always fun traveling with Bobby, especially in some of the more remote areas. I do remember we... Uh, we were in the south somewhere. We had we had a rule at uh, WCW that uh, <laughs> if it was 200 mile, miles or less from one city to the next, we had to drive. Otherwise, we could fly. And uh, this happened to be a, a shot that was, you know, probably 150 miles away. So we got in the car. It was me, Tony Schiavone, uh, the brain, and, uh, you know, maybe Mike Sinead or Okerlund. You know, it could have right. been, I, I forget who was, the other ones were. But uh, we just encountered the... Uh, this little southern restaurant, and their their uh, blue plate special was hot dog salad. And, wow! Uh, which, oh yeah, you know that, that's a definite mixture. A, a, a wonderful southern delicacy, I'm sure. But yeah, yeah, you know, you just encountered all kinds of interesting things when you're on the road. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Heaton was uh, Heaton was a lot of fun. We uh, we uh, spent so many hours together. You know, both uh, behind the microphones and behind the scenes and in the dressing rooms and you know that's 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 where we always said the best fun and the best fights were was 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 in the back absolutely well, speaking of fights what was the backstage atmosphere like in wcw really very good uh you know everybody seemed to uh to 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 get along and be pretty supportive of uh of everybody else uh you know we didn't really have uh uh and I really would tell you if I thought there was something that that, that was ugly. Uh, I mean, why not? It, you know, the dirt sheets probably had it. But you know, nothing that really comes comes to mind that was was horrible. You, you guys have to understand that wrestling is very, very, very fraternal. And in in my case, uh, the reason I got into wrestling at all was my grandfather was a wrestler, so I was kind of born into it. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I was on the radio, <laughs> pardon me, the uh, guys that had the territory in Phoenix, they were looking for somebody who not only knew about wrestling, but was also a broadcaster. So at a very young age, I filled the bill. So back in the old Phoenix Madison Square Garden days, uh, the top heel at the time was Iron Mike DiBiase. Mm. It was Ted DiBiase's son. So, you know, I've known Ted since essentially we were both kids. Mm. And you just know these guys for so many years that uh, it really becomes very, very familial, which isn't to say, you know, brothers and sisters and brothers and brothers fight all the time, mm. and that certainly was the case, but it was probably more familial than in, than any other sport I can think of. You weren't at the event where he passed away, were you? 
All right, Mike, to be honest. Oh, where, where Mike uh, passed away? No, I was not. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't have. Not. I think that was in Texas. So I could be mistaken. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when did you actually stop working with WCW? Uh, two thousand. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that was uh, when I uh, I left WCW and uh, really. Uh, th- that's, uh, you know, my wife asks me all the time. Do you miss it? Do you miss it? And everybody asks me, you know, once in a while. Well, do you uh, miss it? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, and and what I miss, guys, is really what I was talking about was was, was the camaraderie. I miss, uh, uh, you know, being uh, being back with the fellas and uh, uh, you know just uh, telling stories. And uh, that was always the best part of wrestling to me was was being in the dressing room before an event. Uh, WCW, for example, would be uh, you know me and Larry Zabisco and and Dusty Rhodes and Shivani and, and Heenan and uh, Okerlund. And, uh, we just had, had great fun, and then, you know, everybody got together, the, the announcers and the wrestlers, and it was, uh, and, and the crew guys, certainly, you know, they, they're, they're the unsung heroes of any wrestling production, is, you know, the guys out there that set things up and, you know, run the cameras and are out in the truck making sure it looks good. Uh, it was a very, very... Uh, like I said, familial environment, and and that's really what I miss. Do I miss uh, the travel? Oh, not not ever. You know, it's been, in 1998, I think, or 99, I was Delta Airlines' top domestic uh, passenger. I had over a million miles just on Delta Airlines in one year. Wow. Well, let me ask you a radio-based question. Is is yes. I'm in radio myself. Uh-huh. Um, what was the production uh, like as far as radio versus um, television, and more specifically, uh, wrestling? Uh, as, as far as what? You, you know, wrestling, uh, coverage of wrestling, or... or, or, uh, or... I mean, as far as, as, as the announcing aspect is... Oh, I see. Well, you know, it was... There was no real syndicated radio. I, you know, although I've been on radio for, you know, over 40 years, as hard as that is to believe especially for me uh, back then there was no satellite programming or syndicated programming and and uh, the guys on the radio and I, and I say guys because women really didn't get into it until you know the, the, the 70s you know you had to be you had to be funny and spontaneous and intelligent and you had to be well read you had to go to theater you, had, you, know, you you just really needed to know everything that was going on especially within you know your localized community you know, whether it was New York City or 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 or, or Blythe, California, uh, you needed to be able to relate to the audience, and I think that's that's how re- uh, radio has certainly changed over the years, and and I don't much care for it, and uh, I think that that was really a, a a good a good launching pad for anybody that uh, that does professional wrestling, because you have to have an affinity for first of all what you're doing, and you have to have an affinity for the sport for the guys. Uh, for, if, if you will, the, the theater of it all, because it is entertainment, just like radio is. And, you know, I, I, I don't shrink from the word entertainment because I think the NBA is entertainment and Major League Baseball is entertainment and, you know, the, uh, the NFL is entertainment. I mean, you, you buy a ticket to go to an event to be entertained. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an old radio guy. Gene Okerlund is an old radio guy. Uh, Tony Schiavone. Uh, we, we all have our, our roots in radio. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. Through through my education, I've actually had the opportunity to sit down and actually watch some old tapes of old uh, of old radio jocks um, trying to learn my craft, uh, and to see the personality that they had to actually ooze out over the mic. Oh, absolutely. What I see now is just such a vast difference, and, and I agree with you. I, I got to say, it's kind of sad to see such a change happen. Yeah, radio was never intended to be a one-size-fits-all media, which is why I'm really glad to be on the air with you guys, uh, because you know exactly who you're talking to. It's not like TV, where you know you're trying to talk to everybody at the same time. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you if know, you the, watch, the, the, if you the, watch something like Good Morning America, you see them yeah. interview Batista, and they they talk to him like he's a bull, like how much you lift. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, who cares? Right. Right. You know, uh, with, with radio. Uh, you know, if you're playing rock and roll, you know, the people that are listening like rock and roll. Or if you're playing, you know, like, like I do, I, I have, 
uh, you know, a, a number of oldies uh, stations throughout the country that, that I program. You know, I know exactly who the audience is. Country music, the same way. News talk, the same way. I mean, you really know who you're talking to. Uh, TV, you know, the, the, same, the same TV show that's showing, uh, you know, 60 Minutes, you know, earlier in the morning was showing Woody Woodpecker cartoons. You know, it, it, it just runs too much of a gamut. You try to, you try to appeal to too many people with TV. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not doubting TV. I think, you know, the service they provide, of course, is, is obviously wonderful. But it's not as personal as radio. Mm. You know, when, when you think about how you listen to the radio, uh, you're probably alone. <laughs> as opposed to, you know, nobody sits in their living room with their family and watches the radio. <laughs> so radio becomes a, a, a far more personal form of communication because you're really quite likely only talking to one person and that one person tuned into you because there's something about you that they really like you know which which even makes it that much more upsetting with with the clear channels and oh, if sure. i'm getting into the business it's hard for me to to actually want to you know work for such a station in some aspects simply because they take the jocks that they get and they almost take that personal um aspect away from them not oh. telling them, you know, everything scripted, what they have to say. And it's, it's kind of dejecting in a way. It is. And, and this will be kind of a, a left-handed analogy, guys, uh, radio and wrestling. As you said, radio is, you know, uh, everybody doing the same thing, saying the same thing, and really not, not having an affinity for anybody in particular. Uh, you know, you, you and I, we're here in the western United States. You know, somebody on the East Coast, they think differently, they do different things, they have different likes and dislikes than we do, and you can't go on the radio and try to appeal to everybody. Uh, and what I really don't like about the state of radio now is there are no places to go for a young person to learn the business of radio. You know, the, the, you can't do, uh, you know, the all-night show in Yuma, because that show doesn't exist anymore. There's some satellite program that's doing that show. Well, that's where a young disc jockey or a news person or sports commentator, you went and you, you learned and you, and you made your mistakes and you got better, and, and that's how you wound up in, in, in L.A. or Detroit or, or, or Boston or New York. Uh, and the same with wrestling. You know, the territories used to allow a young wrestler to, to learn the craft, you know, take the bumps, you know, develop a persona, right. and that doesn't exist anymore. There are there are no more territories per se. I mean, there are a few independents out there, but 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 no place where where a young wrestler could go on the road, literally five days a week, uh, you know, town to town, and uh, and learn the sport of wrestling and learn everything that there was to learn about it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is, uh, again, like you said, you, you you listen to the old tapes of the old disc jockeys. Uh, a lot of what a lot of the younger wrestlers were able to to, uh, to learn back in the day, and it wasn't that long ago, was if you just shut your mouth in the dressing room, you would learn more about professional wrestling by listening to people like a Bruno Sammartino or a Freddie Blassie or a Bobby Heenan or a Dusty Rhodes or a Ric Flair. Just be quiet and listen to what these guys have to tell you. And you'll learn more about the business, you know, in a, in a year doing that than, than anything I can think of. But that doesn't exist anymore. Mm. In the old days, Actually, we just uh, had an opportunity to sit down with Charlie Hoffs, who was recently released from the WWE. Uh-huh. And his motto is exactly what you're just talking about. He said, you know, when I'm in the locker room, uh, I keep my, 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 my ears open and my eyes and mouth uh, shut. All he does is listen to what's going on. There's and really, really try to absorb there's almost an, an unwritten rule in wrestling, and that is, unless you've been doing it for five years, you don't get a vote, you don't get to talk, and it's, it's not like a hazing, like somebody's going to jump you if you do, but if you're smart, like Charlie, just be quiet and listen to what these men are telling you, or actually telling each other, and you'll pick up more, you know, and the other thing is, after a number of years, especially in, in, in wrestling, as I say, being as fraternal as it is, you kind of earn your stripes. You, 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 you've earned the, the, the right to have an opinion about something. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it, it's, it's really not dissimilar from being, uh, you know, being a rookie in the, 
in, in, in baseball. You know, a, a rookie playing for the Houston Astros is not going to go into the clubhouse and tell Roger Clemens how to throw a fastball. Right. It, it, it's really the same dynamic. Absolutely, and if you remember, you know, 10 years ago, people would go to Memphis, or 20 years ago, I should say, and they'd be in Memphis for a good five years before they thought they were good enough to go up to the WWF or whatever, like Honky Tonk Man, for example. Sure. He was wrestling from 78 to 88 before he decided, well, I guess I'm good enough now, you know? Yeah, that's a, an interesting story, the whole Honky Tonk Man story. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, uh, um, uh, he, he was actually uh, designated to be the first Brutus Beefcake. Huh. But but he got sick. So wow. uh, Vince, uh, you know, did did what he did, and and uh, you know, and Ed Wesley became Brutus uh, Brutus Beefcake. Yeah, who we just so, interviewed. Yeah. Yeah, he's very interesting. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, he is. And a lot of the guys are very very interesting. Uh, when you get to know them, one of the things that that I think uh, is is very interesting for fans is is the majority of these guys were college All-Americans, either as uh, football players, uh, basketball players in some cases, like, like uh, Kevin Nash, uh, or, or wrestling All-Americans. And those that played football or, or, or basketball, you know, maybe they had an injury that didn't allow them to go into the NBA or the NFL. Most of these guys and are, are college graduates, and many of them have graduate degrees. <laughs> Absolutely. If you could take a step back for just a second. Sure. We're talking about all this all this stuff with WCW a little earlier. Uh, something that still boggles my mind is how cheap the company was sold to Vince McMahon, especially when somebody else was willing to pay more money for it. Let's talk about uh, the death of WCW and your opinions of it. Oh, gee. It was, uh, I was really, uh, really sad to see it go. Like, uh, it was sad to see any wrestling uh, organization go just because... Uh, I don't like it when, when one company, and this is nothing against Vince or WWE, uh, you know, it could have been, uh, you know, Vern and the AWA, or, you know, who knows. But for one company to so control uh, the sport, I, I, I didn't like, and, and uh, most people don't. Uh, the death of WCW, you know, uh, I, I don't fully understand it. I don't get it. Uh, you know, I know it was a very expensive organization to run, but, but it was different than, than the WWE. And we always thought that, that we had the advantage, for, and for a long time we did, because keep in mind the WCW was, was a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Ted Turner's dynasty. <laughs> so in actuality, the WCW was part of a television company that produced wrestling whereas the WWE was a wrestling company that had to produce television. Right. So all we really, you know, in actuality, although, you know, we had sellout crowds, you know, virtually everywhere, it really didn't matter what the WCW did at the gate because to Turner, we were just producing another TV show. Huh. And, and the bulk of the money came from advertising revenues. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when you start selling out, you know, uh, you know multi-thousand uh, seat venues, you know, then even Ted Turner's eyes get open because there's a lot of money to be made there. But, uh, you know, money-wise, the, uh, the gate was really not the driving force for WCW, where it was for WWF and, and now WWE. Absolutely. You did some work with Women of Wrestling. Um, that company seemed to have an odd cult following throughout the years. Uh, what's your take on that company? You know, I really thought it was a good idea. Uh, David McLean, uh, he, David's kind of a P.T. Barnum kind of guy. I've known David a long time, and he asked me to be involved in it. It sounded fine. It, uh, and uh, he had some very, very good athletes involved in it. And he was uh, based at the Forum, uh, you know, the former home of the L.A. Lakers. Correct. And uh, it just... Uh, it just wasn't marketed properly. Hmm. It, uh, it it just ran out of steam, unfortunately. But yeah, it was it was it was it was kind of cultish, kind of cool. Uh, it did have uh, have its own following, hmm. you know. It, uh, like anything David McLean does, it's kind of done with, with with a wink and a smile. <laughs> yeah, I mean, from what I understand, a lot of the guys that were in the WCW and WWF locker rooms were actually watching it, and uh, one of the things that they loved, from uh, what a couple people told us, was the Patty Pizzazz theme song. They used to sing it to each other. 
<laughs> yeah, probably so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we uh, we actually did a, a, a pay per view where where uh, uh, Bobby Heenan and I uh, you know kind of reunited to do the the, uh, the commentary on it. So uh, that that was fun. So Bobby even had a uh, uh, a tour with uh, with uh, women of wrestling. And I think he had the line of the night when he said, "This is the first time I've looked up a guy's trunks." Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> but knowing Heenan, it probably wasn't. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> no, Bobby's done. <laughs> There's nothing that Bobby Heenan hasn't done in this uh, in this sport, and uh, for him to be inducted into the Hall of Fame is is, is really tremendous. And uh, I know it meant a lot of uh, a lot to Bobby and a lot to his family uh, to see him inducted into the uh, into the Hall of Fame. We interviewed him uh, literally just days after he was inducted last year, and you know. He, you can tell that he legitimately and emotionally was, you know, honored by it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, because uh, it, you know wrestling is, uh, you know, a, a sport and, and entertainment. It is whatever you know, whatever label you want to put on it. That really has never done a very good job of of validating uh, its own. Uh, you know, it, in fact, some say wrestling is a business that, that eats its young, and there, there probably is. Uh, more examples of that than, than anything else. Uh, you know, there really is no standing Hall of Fame for professional wrestling. Right. You know, stuff like like Cooperstown for baseball, or even the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Yeah. You know, th there's not a building where you can go into and and see uh, clips of Gorgeous George, or you know, see uh, uh, Sputnik Monroe's uh, you know ring robe. You know, right. that that doesn't exist. So the next best thing is 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 uh, what uh, the McMahon family did, and uh, and Bobby uh, certainly worthy of of induction into that or any other wrestling Hall of Fame. Yeah, and they're doing their best with that. I I hope that they would one day open a building. However, I must say that um, if they're going to make it a true wrestling Hall of Fame, that they have to start inducting people like Hackenschmidt and people that go way back when. So they so they have a full gamut of who was there. You know, you also have to you also have to validate and and induct people outside of your own organization. Uh, I did an interview recently, which I'm actually going to send you guys uh, to see what you think, uh, an interview that I did with Bruno Sammartino. Excellent. And this gave me an opportunity to talk to Bruno about what I've always called the greatest match that never was, which would have been a match between Bruno Sammartino and Vern Gagne. Hmm. And both of them, both Vern and Bruno, regret that that match never took place. Uh, for, you know, to some people, for some very obvious reasons. But for it to be a, a legitimate Hall of Fame, as you said, you've got to induct, you know, Hackenschmidt, you've got to induct Vern Gagne, and you've got to induct, you know, guys that were not in your organization. Mm. Absolutely, and, and that's going to be a, something that we're going to have to see years down the line when it's time for somebody like Sting to be inducted. You know, will <laughs> will they do it? Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know why they would, because... You know, maybe he'd be the first, uh, although by all rights he shouldn't be. Uh, you know, let's go back, like you said, to, to the Hackett Schmitz or even uh, uh, guys like Gorgeous George or uh, or uh, uh, some of the guys from, you know, Count Billy Varga, uh, uh, John Tolis, you know, guys that, that, that really paid their debt in blood to the sport but uh, never, never worked for, uh, for the McMahon family. Right. Which is not to say that, you know, that, that's not a rub on the McMahon family, you know. Yeah. Absolutely not. It's just that, that, that these uh, these people never uh, never wrestled for the McMahons. Hmm. Well, how, can, how, can, how, can a, how can you have a Hall of Fame without uh, without Gorgeous George? It's like, how can you have a Hall of Fame without, you know, Ty Cobb? Absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned that uh, you've been doing the voice of Tony the Tiger lately. i got a favor to ask you. Could you give us uh, one there, great? Sure. Let me let me find it in my throat here because it always kind of, kind of comes from the back. They're great. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I never even thought of it until you said that. Then I thought for a second, wow, I sound like I'm interviewing Tony the Tiger. It seems like a perfect <laughs> fit for you. <laughs> well, I'm really looking forward to uh, to the Wrestle Reunion event. You know, not only hooking up with uh, you know some of the guys again, but uh, uh, you know I'm anxious to see the Funk Brothers wrestle. The Funks and, and, and Mick Foley yeah. you know, taking on the original Midnight Express. That should be a lot of fun. That should be. And he's also doing his own uh, Mick at Night show, from what I uh, understand from uh, yeah. Bob Russell. Yeah, he is. 
He is. And that should be I'm, extremely entertaining. Right. In fact, I'm, uh, you know, going to go uh, later on this month to uh, Puerto Rico to do a show with Rob mm. to, uh, to San Juan. And I think uh, uh, Diamond Dallas Page is, uh, is on that show as well. Yes, there's a lot of stars that he's got. He's got a lot of things going on with the Gladiator Championship Wrestling. I hope that he can find some uh, television deal or something, because that would be a uh, very interesting thing to watch. Yeah, I, I think it will be. Uh, like I said, I'd, I'd like I'd like for there to be, you know, some other organizations. Uh, you know, uh, TNA. You know, they're, they're they're trying as best they can to to do uh, you know to make a, a, an impact, and uh, I, I guess they are. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is quite good, but uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, it's a WWE, WWE world, and uh, some people think that's wonderful, and some people don't. And uh, you know, I was uh, I was like to have more options than just vanilla. Right. Right. You, you mentioned just a few minutes ago about some of the interviews that you've sat down to do, and we definitely plan to air those. Great. Um, on some of our internet radio shows. Why don't you tell the fans a little bit about what they can expect from this uh, vast stockpile of interviews that you possess? Well, there, there was two that that, uh, that I was really anxious to do. One was, uh, of course, with Bruno Sammartino, who... Uh, yeah, I interviewed him, luckily enough, about uh, two years ago, and what a great guy he was. You know, for for those that have been around for a while, you know who he is, and, and for those kind of new to the sport, unfortunately, uh, you don't. Uh, and, and this is a, a problem, you know, with, with the WWE and, and, and only, I don't know, you know, there's something going on between the McMahons and Bruno that, uh, for whatever reason, they, they will not validate him on the level in which he should be, or any overture that they make is rejected by Bruno. Uh, something's going on there. And, and, and it's quite unfortunate. But uh, the point is, Bruno Sammartino, you know, long before there was a, a Hulk Hogan or a, or a Ric Flair, I mean, this was the the guy. And, uh, you know, uh, at the time it was it was Bruno Sammartino and Vern Gagne were, were, were the heavyweight champions of the world, undisputed. And uh, he was spectacular. Uh, the other interview was with Larry Zabisco. And... Uh, the position I took with Larry is is one that I've held for a long time, and that is if if you really take the time to look at the record, uh-huh. there's probably no professional wrestler that has held more world belts than Larry Zabisco. The guy's been a tag team champion. He's been a world champion, uh, you know, multiple times and in multiple uh, organizations. Uh, but somehow, you know, his position has always been, I'm the guy that retired Bruno Sammartino, I'm the guy that retired Nick Bockwinkle. And I just confronted him with that. You know, why, why does your legacy always have to be you know, associated with, with that when, when your record as a professional wrestler is, is so, so above reproach? And he thought about it, and he gave me what I thought was the first time he honestly answered it. And that was that the problem that he really has was with promoters. They would never give him the push that they would give to uh, to uh, uh, a Bruno Sammartino or a Ric Flair or a Hulk Hogan or or somebody else who would, who had ever won a championship, and and Larry was also uh, one of those guys who would just speak his mind, and he admits you know that that, that Bruno Sammartino is and always will be his hero, but he feels that. In, when, when you reference professional re- wrestlers, he goes, why is it always Bruno and Larry? Why is it always Gagne and Larry? Why is it always Hogan and Larry? Why is it always Bachwinkle and Larry? It should be Larry and Bruno and Larry and Hogan and Larry and Flair. And, and again, if you really want to take the time and, and look into it, you could probably make a case for Larry's position. Yeah. And I think that's the first time he's really come out and, and said that he, he, he feels that he's been, uh, been snubbed uh, that uh, that his uh, his status as, as a professional wrestler and his accomplishments as a professional wrestler have not been validated by either the promoters or the media uh, at the level that they probably rightly deserve to be uh, addressed. Right. Uh, he was probably my second or third interview going way back to 2002. Yeah, way back. But, um, you know, I did an interview with him, and I'll never forget that a year later the phone rings, and it's him, and, you know, I don't know why he called me, but 
he just wanted to talk wrestling for a few minutes. And I was just, oh, yeah. I was stunned. I was like, wow, I'm sitting here getting a personal phone call from one of perhaps the greatest of all time. And it's oh, a real absolutely. Honor. And, you know, a, 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 a lot of the wrestlers are, are, are like that. You know, if they, if they find somebody in the media that they know is really knowledgeable, it isn't just a mark, you know, and isn't going to ask a bunch of stupid questions, but really, you know, has, has a feeling for what it is to, to participate in this sport. They love to talk about it. They love to talk about wrestling. They're proud of what they do. Right. Well, then you got to remember the name James Walsh, because I'll tell you what, he is a, a true wrestling aficionado. Uh, him and I have had many discussions where, you know, we, we've talked about, like you said, watching wrestling at ESPN, remembering um, Jeff Jarrett just getting his start in the business. Sure. Uh, um, and the transformation that he's made over the years. And uh, I definitely agree with you. I think wrestlers are proud of what they do and definitely enjoy that aspect, because there's so many interviews that you hear on other radio stations and in other Internet shows where, you know, it is just people who, who, you know, know the last maybe two, three years of the business. It yeah. don't really offer the history. And, and, you know, I think whenever someone can sit down in an interview capacity and talks to wrestlers, you know, about the history of the business, it makes it that much more entertaining. Right. And, like I said, they, did, they don't like and I don't like, you know, talking to, to what, what are known as marks. You know, uh, the dirt sheet guys, uh, you know, uh, the people that do those, you know, I have really nothing against them, but, but I think anybody that is into that so much that, you know, to me they're like Trekkies. You know, they just suck the fun right out of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, why can't you just enjoy it for what it is? Right. There's, there's a happy medium between being knowledgeable about it and being obsessive and then really uh, obnoxious about it as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I've known, uh, you know, people, you know, throughout my life, they could, they could recite every stat off the back of every baseball card ever printed, but wouldn't know what hand to put a glove on. Yeah, but they, but they think they know everything about, about the business, about the sport. And uh, I, 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 I don't know what to, you know, to tell people like that other than, well, you, you know, you really don't. Right. You know, you think you do, but you don't. I mean, I mean, there's just so many questions that we ask that I know a lot of other people have asked, like, what are your thoughts on the death of WCW? The difference is we, we actually care regarding, you know, why it happened, the ramifications that it, that it had to the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and to some level, we're concerned about the workers themselves. You know, where do they go? You know, there's exactly. no competition. And, and not just to get dirt, but because, you know, when we saw WCW close, we understood that, you know, it, it would be nice to see, you know, WCW and WWF interact to some degree. Right. But, you know, it was going right. to leave a huge void in the business that was detrimental to a lot of people. I was watching wrestling for, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years at that point, and I actually stopped watching for over a year. Not many people know this, but I actually stopped watching for over a year because I thought, well, oh, what's going to happen? Competition is what makes the business get better. Raw got, Raw got better because Nitro was better than that. And, uh, you know, that's what, and Nitro kept trying to be better than Raw, and that's what gave good programming on both channels on Monday right. night. Well, we, you know, we had, we had the double barrel. We had Nitro and Thunder, and, uh, you know, that was, uh, personally, the, the, the thing that, that, that I'm very proud of, and I know that uh, a lot of other guys are, are proud of, it was uh, our Thunder show was on Thursday nights. Uh-huh. And Thursday nights were, was the night on which the Seinfeld show was also aired. Yeah. And the, the last Seinfeld show, there were so many local TV stations and even some of the, the cable networks that did not program anything new because they know they were going to get killed. So why, why, you know, why waste a new episode of something when Seinfeld's going to kill us? Well, we went on with our Thunder show, uh, and we had one of the highest ratings that that show ever had uh, on the, uh, the night of the, the Jerry Seinfeld show, uh, Swan Song. So... Uh, yeah, it was it, it was it was a great time, and, and I, I'm I'm sorry that's gone. Really sorry it's gone. And, I, and I'll tell you what else I'm sorry about. You know, these people want to ask about the death of of, of WCW. Uh, you know, we also need to ask. You know, as, as just human beings who care about each other, uh, we need to to ask about the death of Kurt Hennig. We need to ask about the death of Rick Rude. Yeah. Uh, you know. 
those are some important things that 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 need to be addressed, and and somehow uh, they're not. Yeah, I mean, and this also really annoys me. And I was taking a journalism course at the time. Of course, I have my degree now. And I was talking with a teacher about a week after Kurt Hennig died. Mm -hmm. And I was asking the question, how come if a baseball player gets a staph infection that's, you know, played 30 years ago, it's covered in the news, but a professional wrestler, which has a huge fan base, dies? And I couldn't find one article in our local papers at all about it. I know. I know. I know. Uh... There's probably a hundred reasons. Uh, I'm not sure any of them are any good, uh, but uh, I'm sure your journalism professor, uh, you know, had some reasons as well. Or the sports editor of the of the Arizona Republic had uh, his or her reasons as well. Uh, I don't know. It, it it should have been covered, and, and it, it it you know the death of of, of Kurt Hennig, and I, I loved Kurt. We were very very good friends. Um, it, it hurt me very much. Uh, not only that he died, but uh, but the way in which he died. Uh, and, uh, Did you know yeah. that he was, you know, engaging in those activities? I'm sorry. Did you know that he was, you know, enjoying those party materials? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, let's just say I wasn't surprised. Oh, okay. I wasn't surprised. <laughs> you have to. The thing about wrestling and, and any other sport, uh, you know, you hear the stories about. You know, the NFL and the NBA, I mean, you know, these guys are now getting a, a drug test, you know, all the time. But there's an interesting combination of elements. One is the amount of money these guys make. And, and, and finally, wrestlers are making the same kind of money that, that, that athletes in other sports are making, and that's long overdue. Mm -hmm. So you're making a lot of money. You're on the road. You're away from your family. You've got a lot of time on your hands, and you're always in pain. Mm. That's a bad combination of things. I remember I sat down with uh, Bonnie Steamboat, and Bonnie Steamboat was explaining it to me. Uh, yeah. She was telling me, uh, she's actually a good friend of mine, and she was saying, you know, here's the situation when you're a wrestler. You need to take, you, you're on the road so often that you're in pain, so you need to take painkillers. Right. Then, then you need to get up for the match because painkillers kind of wear you out, so you take speed. Right. Well, then you need to sleep at night, so you got to take downers. Mm -hmm. So in the morning again, you got to take speed to wake up. And she's like, "Okay, there's your drugs." <laughs> well, you know, there is that cycle, and then you also mix in the fact that you've got a lot of money, that you're away from your wife and kids, you know, you're away from the people that you love, and you got nothing but idle time on your hands. Uh, you know, you, you, you go to the gym, you train for a couple hours, you know, you, you go to the arena. Uh, but what do you do with the rest of the time? You know, you can only watch so much daytime TV. Uh, it, it's a very dangerous combination of things. And uh, for somebody like, like a Kurt Hennig or, or really any professional athlete, you know, there's a huge difference between playing, playing hurt and playing in pain. You know, most athletes are always playing in pain. Uh, and professional wrestlers, you know, the bumps these guys take, you know, they're always in pain. And uh, I once heard it said that that bliss is the absence of pain. Huh. And and for these guys to experience that, you know, a lot of times uh, I think any athlete will go to, uh, uh, you know, so, some extremes that uh, society may frown upon. Right. Right. Well, we do appreciate your time here. Do you mind if I just give you a couple of word associations before you let you off, let you off the phone? Sure. Go ahead. Um, if you have a one-word answer, that's great. If you want to share uh, a story, that's great, too. Um, okay. All right, how about uh, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes? Legendary. Where did the uh, name Stagger Lee Marshall come from, anyway? Uh, Dusty gave it to me. Okay. And it, it, it's from an old rock and roll song. Oh. That, uh, you know, being an old rock and roll disc jockey, uh, there, there was a song by a man named Lloyd Price, mm -hmm. and the song is Stagger Lee. Oh, okay. And, uh, and uh, the Dream just gave me that nickname some time ago. And uh, it's one of those that uh, that stuck. Yeah, that, that's funny because we will always look for an opportunity to sing. We right. love to sing. I love to sing. Dusty loves to sing. Uh, so Disco loves to sing. Uh, Hulk Hogan loves to sing. You know, we go out and uh, you know uh, just look for a place where we could you know either sing along or even sometimes commandeer the stage. <laughs> well, How about Hulk Hogan? Underrated. 
Uh, certainly not by me. By far, far and away, my uh, favorite of all time. And I, I defend him to the death. <laughs> uh, as I do as, as well. Uh, you know, the things that he, uh, that he has done and his family have done, you know, it, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, guys. You know, when, when the guy's on the road, you know, his family's not. So uh, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into uh, to, uh, you know, being a professional athlete. And, uh, you know, Hogan, uh, I don't really, you know, care what you think of him about him as, 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 a, uh, as a wrestler. The fact is that, uh, that uh, you know, he carried the sport. He, he, he was the, uh, one of the few people that if you walked up to a person and, and, and you couldn't get them to watch a professional wrestling match at gunpoint, they still knew Hulk, Hulk Hogan. I mean, that's just the way it was. And when you see him walking through an arena today, you know, you got you got five- and six-year-old kids who you know don't know who Hogan is or not, not as much, and they don't sit there thinking, who's this old guy coming to the ring? They see, right. you know, this is a superstar. I better appreciate right. him. You know, there's a very different difference. How about uh, let's switch gears and go back to Tony Schiavone. Misused talent. How about the professor, Mike Tanay? Uh, understated intelligence. <laughs> I got a weird one here for you. I'm not sure if there's going to be anything here, but he's a, a really good guy. We interviewed him over two years ago. How about Scott Hudson? Don't know him that well. Yeah, and I don't think many people do. Uh, how about Diamond Dallas Page? My best friend. Really? Yeah. Had a great opportunity to sit down with uh, Dallas in December. What a great honor that was. Yeah. Great guy. Um... Got a couple names left for you, and then we'll let you go. How about Rob Russin? Determined. And I guess the last name I have on the list is Eric Bischoff. Ambitious. You know, I'm going to take that back. I'll throw you one more, since we didn't talk about him earlier, but we did talk about Kurt. How about Rick Rude? Rick Rude, oh boy, misunderstood. Yeah, just truly one of the nicest guys, mm. one of the nicest men. And 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 a footnote on Shivani when I said mis misapplied. Tony Shivani is a brilliant play-by-play -play baseball guy, mm -hmm. and Tony Shivani should be the voice of the Atlanta Braves, but they'll never give him an opportunity to do that because people associated with wrestling. Oh. Tony's ten times, ten times better than virtually anybody doing major league play-by-play -play right now. Well, he's got the voice for it, that's for sure. I mean, but uh, that is true, though. When you hear his voice, you think the voice of WCW. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And Which, Tony's a brilliant baseball guy. Yeah. Well, we really can't thank you enough for your time. Give us one last plug for Wrestle Reunion coming up in August. Wrestle Reunion in August. <laughs> Either. <laughs> yeah. That's out of Philadelphia, King of Prussia, Philadelphia. Uh, this is this is the fans' event. This is an opportunity for you to uh, to uh, meet and greet and get pictures with and ask questions of. And uh, it's kind of one big locker room, guys. Yeah. Like I said, the locker room was always the best part of the uh, always the best part of professional wrestling. And this three day event is one big locker room, and the fans get to come. Yeah. Oh wow. We really can't thank you enough for your time, Lee. This was uh, far better than I think either Chuck or I expected. Chuck, will you agree with that? I would. It was, it was definitely a pleasure to sit down and speak with you. My pleasure indeed, James, Chuck. Thank you so much. I look forward to speaking with you again. Hi, gang. This is Bean Gene Okerlund from World Wrestling Entertainment reminding you you're where it's at with the interactive interview right here online. Hey, this is Chris Jericho of Fozzy, and you're listening to the Interactive Interview. And remember, we are huge rock stars. That was not Fozzy. No, it was not Fozzy, dude. You know, I, I don't happen to have any other but music. this is Elmo! So uh, we got to get right into SmackDown here, dude, because we are running out of time. We spent so much on Raw, but we enjoyed your call-ins. If anyone else wants to call in, feel free. The number is 480-965-1260. Once again, it's 480-965-1260. Rochester came to... Uh, us from Rochester, New York, which is actually pretty close to my original hometown. Ooh. And uh, we, we, we cut to uh, the ring with Theodore Long saying he wants to thank everyone who watched Great American Bash on Sunday, all five of them. Yes. And uh, 
you know, they crowned the new tag team chance, Heidenreich and Road Warrior. Um, they said they also determined a new, they will also determine, they said, another a new number one contender. Um, the first match we had uh, scheduled this evening was uh, Orlando Jordan and Christian versus Chris Benoit in Booker T. Yeah, it was an interesting match. It was actually a really good a tag team match. And I'll tell you what made it great. At the pay-per-view, the Great American Bash, the... Turn that crap off. There's and nothing the, on, dude. I hear noise. There's no noise. Oh, I apologize. At the Great American Bash, Chris Benoit locked the crippler crossface on Mr. Orlando Jordan. And Orlando Jordan sold that so well that he was actually taped up on SmackDown, which added a complete element to the match that had not been there before. Anybody remember a couple of years ago when Diamond Dallas Page had taped up ribs for like eight months? I do not recall that. Well, it was it was always adding a little element to it because you knew he had a soft spot and a damaged spot, and everybody was going to go right for that. And I think that it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, Crispin Wine Booker T got the win on this one. Um, but uh, again, I have a problem with the way this match ended. Um, we had Orlando Jordan, who is, um, you know, the, the the champion, if you will. Um, in, in the WWE as a, you know, quit messing with my levels, bro. I hear myself too loud in my headphones already. Good. You're touching the wrong dial still. Good times. Anyway, so Orlando Jordan lost this match. You know, he's the United States champion. And the problem with that is is that, you know, I understand Kristen Wildrunner just returned victory. But the, the, the problem that, that went along with that is it makes the title lose some credibility. You know, don't you think, James? I absolutely agree with that. It makes the credible, the title lose a little bit of credibility. I don't think that changing it too often is that good either. However, not defending it at all is going to kill the title. Well, the next match we had was uh, Chris Hamrick and Chuck Atili versus Road Warrior and um, Animal and Heidenreich. Right. Um, I was excited, actually, to see Chris Hamrick work. I'm kind of a fan of, uh, of his work ethic and, and his matches. Unfortunately, we knew he was going to get jobbed to the newly crowned tag team champions, and that is exactly what happened. That is exactly what happened, and something that nobody's picked up on that I did was that last week we had Julio De Nero doing the job, and this week we had Chris Hamrick doing the job. So let me ask you this. Could we see the hot commodity from ECW make a return in the WWE as a tag team? I tend to think not. It would make sense, wouldn't it? Well, uh, you know, it's the wrestling business. It doesn't need to make sense. It just needs to be entertaining. And which led us to our uh, next backstage segment, actually, one that I had predicted. Uh, when we first got our show started, I always kept mentioning there was going to be Bob Holly's real-life girlfriend, a.k.a. Jillian Hall, showing up on SmackDown with a large growth or mole on her face. And I said then, and I'm going to say now, I think it's a ridiculously stupid gimmick. The chick can actually wrestle. They had a lot of work. Um, seeing how there's actually no women wrestlers around anymore. Um... But, yeah, it, it set up a good segment. I, I'm glad, in a way, to see someone else join up with the M&M Click. I think they could be a, a viable stable somewhere down the road. Um, you know, they just need to bring in, uh, you know, one or two more guys, maybe one more female, and they could have a large stable that can make a large impact on, on any of WWE's programming. Took a lot away from the match as Taz and Michael Cole could not get over the spot on her face. Michael Cole even making the line, it looks like a Hershey's kiss. Mm. Really funny. Really funny, Cole. So Give yourself a round of applause. This leads to what appears to be getting really close to the blow-off here of the Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio, where, uh, as, as you predicted, James Walsh, uh, Eddie Guerrero claims to be the son of Dominic, Rey Mysterio's son. He claims to be the father of Dominic. What did I say? Son. Oh, yeah. The father of Dominic. My bad. Dominic, I'm your father, Holmes. I don't know. It kind of takes away from it the fact that Eddie still has to talk a little bit like Cheech and Chong. I think that this segment made the rest of the show seem like a funeral because the crowd was just so dead. Well, it, it, it was long. Um, there, there was a lot of talking that didn't need to be done. and I always have such a problem with that promo to, to, to do that. You know, you need to get to the meat and potatoes. You need to get to it quick. You need to say what you need to say and move on. Um, Eddie Guerrero seems like lately, I don't know if he's being booked this way or being told to do that. It's now time but for another. Yeah, a little technical difficulty. My bad. Um, it, it seems like Eddie Guerrero is being told or, or just choosing to really go along on all those promos. Yes, and I don't know. I don't think it needs to be done. I don't think he had to make that whole drawn-out thing because let me ask you this. If you know what the secret is and you're Rey Mysterio Jr. Chuck, are you going to stand there and let him tell you that entire story for 15 minutes? No, I, I'd either A, A, I wouldn't come to the building with my father if I thought there was going to be some horrific secret being told. Right. 
That's A. B, would I stand in the middle of the ring in front of like 20,000 people and just let some dude ramble at me? No, I'd walk out. Or you'd attack him and take the microphone from him so he can't tell you. Well, I don't know is that someone's going to attack someone the size of <laughs> Eddie Guerrero when the dude's like five. I'm talking about Rey Mysterio. Oh, well, yeah, Rey Mysterio certainly should have should have uh, attacked him. Uh, I don't know. It, it's been a good feud thus far. It's given these guys something to do. I think they need to hurry up and wrap it up, though, man. It's been going on a little too long. But I, this... I disagree. I really think it's it's one of the best long feuds they've had in quite some time. I enjoy it tremendously. I'm looking forward to seeing another match. However, I don't see a way for Eddie to get out of this with a win without completely hurting Rey Mysterio badly. And unfortunately, it seems like that's what they've been building towards, Eddie, for finally beating Ray. Well, I, I think at some point he has to. I think so, too. But if they do it at SummerSlam, it's going to hurt Ray a lot now. Well, because then he's got this bad secret that's told about him, and then he loses. Yeah, but uh, I guess you're right, man. They kind of painted themselves in a new corner on this one. They did? Well, we digress. Back to the Molina versus Tory Wilson match we saw on SmackDown. It was not as bad as I had anticipated. Um, Tori Wilson did the best she could, held her own. Um, it was a passable women's match. I'm not going to say it was match of the year candidate, but, uh, you know, it, you know, it was a typical women's match. Um, Molina's a good worker. Tori tried her best, and I, I really didn't have a problem with it. I, again, it was a pleasant surprise. It was better than I had anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't get any excited for Tori Wilson. I do think Molina is tremendous, and I think she needs to be pushed and pushed hard. Well, let's get into our next match, which was R William Regal versus Scotty Tuhati. Of course, this match never finished as the Mech Schools came out. Um, after being told that they looked like concession stand workers and should go sell food, they came out with food, beat the crap out of William Regal and Scotty Tuhati, and uh, essentially threw nachos on them for a good half an hour. Ooh, this is not racial slurs at all. No, th that's the truth of what happened, man. Uh, again, I think it was too long of a segment. Um, you know, I don't need to see someone get tacos poured on them for, like, 10 minutes. Like, 30 seconds would, you know, do it justice. I don't know. This show was just awful. SmackDown reminds me more and more of a funeral each and every week. And it's not because they have The Undertaker's music there. It's just a horrible, horrible show at this point. And this show did nothing to help anybody. Well, I, I got to kind of disagree with you. I, I thought the women's match was okay. I, I thought that the, the main event, which we haven't talked about, was actually phenomenal. Um, which was JBL versus The Undertaker. That um, I agree with. It that was a typical was big man match, but they both worked their asses off, and it was given adequate time to tell a story. The biggest problem they're facing is not with the quality of the shows, even though the quality of the shows is not what it should be. The biggest problem they're facing is crowd reaction. The crowd does not react, and as such, it feels like a rainy day. It feels like a funeral. It does not feel like anything exciting is going on. It feels terrible. And you would think with a pre-taped show, they can pump in crowd noise. Oh, and they do. Well, then what does that say what the real reaction is? I, I, I don't know, man. I mean, they need to do it so it's more intense because what they're doing now is just so quiet. It's just too damn quiet. It doesn't excite me. Well, we all obviously know how this match finished up. Randy Orton came out. RK owed the Undertaker straight to hell, providing John Bradshaw Layfield with the win, setting up JBL versus Batista round number two coming up at SummerSlam as well as finally... The return match of Undertaker versus Randy Orton, where we all expect Randy Orton to go over, I would assume, um, you know, is, is repayment. And, you know, the Undertaker, to some degree, doing his job by putting over younger talent uh, on a big stage like SummerSlam. When Undertaker was laying there after the RKO, and he looked all shriveled up laying on the ground, I could not help but have the Californian Raisins theme song bouncing off my head. Well, I was surprised at how well he sold that RKO. He legitimately laid in the by. ring for a significant amount of time. Um, and that was a great job by Undertaker. Made, made made Randy Orton look like gold. Yes, it did. Undertaker's a phenomenal worker. I personally don't think he's lost anything over the years. I think that he only looks older when he's laying there all shriveled up. Well, guys, as you can hear the papers flying around in the background, that signals we are out of time for today. We'd like to remind you to check out our official website at www.wrestlingepicenter.com. And, of course, you can go to that website and join the forums and pose your questions to next week's guests, which include the incomparable Paul Bearer, Percy Pringle, as well as Lance Storm. Although we will not be airing both of them next week. We'll only be airing one, probably Percy Pringle. Probably. That, that's, the, that's the direction it looks like we're heading. So make sure you stay tuned for that. You've just listened to the Wrestling Epicenter. For James Wallace, it's your boy Chuck D., you are listening to Arizona State's original alternative, The Blaze, 1260 
a.m. Yay! It's 12.60 a.m. ASU's original alternative, KASC Tempe, Arizona. The Wrestling Epicenter has been around since 2002, and in that time, all of these guests, everybody pictured, has been on our podcast. We're more than just a radio show, though, so check out WrestlingEpicenter.com for all your wrestling news and needs. <laughs>